Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul is talking with big wave surfer Laird Hamilton. In addition to being one of the best known surfers in the world, Laird is also a renowned innovator and guiding genius of crossover board sports, including toe in surfing, stand up paddleboarding, and hydrofoil boarding. He is a best selling author, stuntman, model, producer, TV host, fitness and nutrition expert creator of Extreme Performance Training, and founder of Laird Superfood, as well as husband to professional volleyball player Gabrielle Reese and a father. Considered by many to be one of the world's greatest athletes and big wave surfers, an incredible all-around human being, humanitarian and father, and longtime client and friend of mine, Laird Hamilton and I get together for a deep dive today. In this podcast, Laird and I get into how he created a vocation out of his passion, surfing, and why doing what you love to do is so important in life. We talk about Laird's books, videos, and his roles in big screen movies, such as a James Bond movie that he was in, some of Laird's biggest challenges he's had to overcome, what fear is, how illusory and yet real it can be, and how Laird uses fear as fuel for accomplishment, completion, and to break through challenges. We talk about Laird's superfood company and the mission and values behind it, who some of Laird's greatest influences have been in his life. We get deep into the spiritual practices of breathing and the relationship between breathing and the spirit and soul of us, and we clarify what spirit and soul are. We get into Laird's personal approach to diet and why so many people overeat. Laird and I also discuss the light and dark of biohacking, Laird's thought on the issues of the world and why plant medicines may be so popular at this time. There are millions of people who would pay a large sum of money to sit and chat with Laird and ask him questions, and today you get to enjoy three hours of deep, insightful conversation with one of the world's greatest athletes and a true wise man. Enjoy Laird Hamilton. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. I'm super excited today. I have Somebody who's a a very good buddy of mine. We've worked together for many, many years, and he's uh, used me as a consultant from time to time over the many years and helped have helped him with uh, keeping his body running super good and shared all the wisdom I could possibly share with him because that's what I do. And he shares his wisdom with me, and that makes a great relationship. And that is Laird Hamilton, well known as probably the most well recognized surfer in the world. And he has written several great books, such as The Force of Nature, Life Writer, The Heart, Body, and Soul of Life Beyond the Ocean. He's got many amazing videos that you can find out there. He is the founder of Laird Superfood. He has creamers, InstaFuel, Performance Mushrooms, Hydrate, and his own awesome coffee, which I'm sure he'll mention. And he's also... Uh, an inventor. So welcome, Laird. It's lovely to be able to spend a couple of hours chatting with you. It's uh, I have to schedule a podcast for us to hang out. Yeah, well, that's what happens when life uh, life gets rolling. It seems like we're we're always, you know, we need excuses. Rolling. We need excuses to you know collide. So whatever. Yeah, we'll take. take no, I, I was curious. What's the name of? Is it the hydrofin that you invented? Uh, well, no, the high, it's called there, it's hydrofoil, but foil. Uh, yeah. Right. And I didn't really, I, I, cause I always, I'm always leery of, you know, of titles and inventing and that stuff. And the, the truth is, is, you know, they say there's nothing new, just a new application of an old idea. So obviously hydrofoils have been around for a long time and, you know, we, right. we just kind of created a, we, we, we just, we realized, I think that they would be able to you know, ride the energy of a wave. And, and then we made ones you could stand on, um, from an existing device. So it's more like a hybrid, but you know, more, it's more really ultimately about kind of, you know, something that you're very familiar with is just understanding the ramifications of certain things, right. That, that really separates, uh, people when it comes to innovation, it's, you know, when you, when you have an idea of what, yeah, you have to have a fairly broad, uh, broad knowledge and a depth of knowledge or you don't understand how to transfer one concept to another domain. Amen. But uh, so you've done that. I know you really did a lot to popularize stand up paddleboarding, yes, didn't I you? Did. Yeah. In fact, I was, I probably did stand up for 
I don't know, years. I, I probably had six or seven years uh, alone. And then, and then I got a couple, uh, a couple of friends that didn't care what people thought to participate uh, with me. And then, and then it, be, you know, and then it got momentum and, you know, where, where they say, where there are more than two, I'll be there. And so then before you know it, it was, it was, uh, it, now it's like, now you can find it in Dubai. <laughs> You, you know who's saying that is, don't you? I do. <laughs> oh, <laughs> who? Oh, not yours. <laughs> no. Jesus. Amen. Jesus said, whenever two or more get together in my name, I will be there. Absolutely. Um, the uh, cool thing is yesterday, a friend of ours came to visit us and see our place and she gave us a stand up paddleboard as a gift. So I have a, uh, I was thinking, oh, Laird, if Laird comes to visit me, he can stand up paddleboard on our pond and <laughs> hang out with the bullfrogs. Perfect. I'll just have to get you a bungee and, and tie you to the shore so you can just paddle in place, you know? Oh, well, the pond's pretty big. It's probably an acre. Okay. You know, you can, you can go out in a canoe and paddle around and get a little workout if you Do want. some circles. Yeah, you just circle around and have fun. And we've got a zip line, and Mana and Mana and I've swam in it and had fun in it. And so, uh, yeah, it's cool. Well, I just kind of wanted to share with people a little bit about what you're up to, and and so they can find more information. I love your books, Absolutely. and um, the one I haven't uh, got though is Life Writer. So I was surprised. I said, "Oh, there's a book about Lairds I didn't know about. I'd love to get my hands on that." So at some point, I will. But uh, um, it was neat to see that you've been busy writing and, and, uh, the, the last one that I got, uh, I got from you was when you wrote uh, force of nature and thanks for mentioning me in there. That was nice of you. I'm, I'm excited to have you on the show and I'm sure most people listening know who you are. So I don't think we need you to rehash your entire, uh, childhood history and all that. And there's a great movie that does go through that. What's the name of that movie, Laird? I've seen the movie that talks about your childhood and how you got into surfing and, how your mother um, met the man she married with your help and things like that. Uh, that's take every wave uh, is the, is the kind of the bio film. I mean, there's been, you know, snippets of, of kind of some of my life history and other, other films, uh, riding giants and, and step into liquid and some other, some of these other ones, but, but take every wave is, was uh, it was directed by Rory Kennedy. Who's the, who's a award-winning documentarian and, and, uh, her and her husband, uh, did a, a beautiful job and, uh, you know, they were able to make a nice, uh, a nice, uh, interesting entertainment. Let's just put it that way, which. Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. And, um, you've been in, in, I know you've been in, uh, I'm pretty sure if I memory serves me right, you were in a James Bond movie. How many movies have you been in now? You know, over the years, you know, I mean, I was in, you know, I was in Waterworld. I was in North Shore, another film uh, when I was a kid. I, I you know, I, I've probably been involved in in 10 features, maybe something like that. Uh, That's cool. That's yeah, great. That, it's an interesting process. You know, you the, I think it's always easy to glamorize being in a movie and then you get on a set. Uh, I mean, when we're making films about surfing. That's, you know, it's like, hey, we're going to go surfing and tell the guy to film it kind of thing. That's different than when you work on a feature. Um, and, and those things are, you know, I was able to work with Clooney on Descendants and, and uh, you know, and, and, and though the, you realize the process of filmmaking is, is, is pretty, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, it can be boring, but it's, it's just, it, it's an arduous process that, that, take some enduring i think people glamorize it and the fact is is it's difficult <laughs> yeah one of my clients robbie madison who's a stunt motorcyclist who's broken all of evil knievel's records he was in um i think this uh not the most recent but the one before that where the guy races through a, a hotels and buildings in between buildings on a motorcycle he's the guy riding the motorcycle and he's done lots of stunts for movies like that and he's told me about all the pressures and demands and takes and retakes yeah. and all sorts of stuff. So yeah. I'm, and I've worked with Chuck Norris has been a client of mine. So I, I've kind of understand what you mean. It's, it's it, what you see on, on the screen is very different than what 
what uh, actually goes into making it. And, and I don't know if you know this, but my father was a special effects man for Universal Studios for quite some time. Well, yeah, it's the hurry up, and wait, right? It's the hurry, it's the hurry up. It's like be ready, and in a way, it's kind of there. There's there is an irony uh, to the process where it's kind of you know it's kind of like life at least and in, in, i can relate to it and it's like being in the fire department or any situation you know where you like hurry up and be be fully ready ready to go any second but you don't know when it's going to happen and it might not or it might but you know it's like one of those things where you're kind of just you're living in flux but you need to be completely ready and prepared the whole time and and that that's can be exhausting just having that kind of that mental you know preparedness uh, well, you've just exactly described what it's like to be in the 82nd Airborne Division. Believe me, I've had many very intense mornings of, you know, them putting on the show that you're going to war and then you end up sitting in 105 degree heat on a concrete uh, runway waiting for four hours for an airplane to come. And then you fly around in circles for another three or four hours. And then, you know, it's a game as soon as they don't hand you live ammunition, but they hand you blanks and you go, Oh my God, all this shit. I could have done a million things by now, but I'm playing this stupid ass game of hurry up, yeah. act like it's real. And then <laughs> realize it's not. <laughs> well, you never just, you never know. And in, in a way it's, it, I mean, it, it, sometimes I feel like as difficult as that is, it definitely, it, it, it's, it's, there's a, there's an, you know, a connection to how life is. It's like, you know, always, always kind of being ready. You know, the truth is that we've, we've been able to have the luxury because we're so, you know, because of the nature of the way we've evolved that we, we have the luxury to not have to be ready all the time. We, we don't, we don't have to, you know, run at a moment's notice and chase something or run away from something or, you know, have that. We don't have, we're not, and so uh, there's there is something about that process is that as difficult as it is does prepare us for an, a, a kind of an honest existence, you know. Yeah, well, as you know, as soon as you have children, then then that kind of training becomes viable because you do need to have one eye open at all times, at least yeah. one. Yeah, and a hand and a hand um, ready. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I'm curious, how did it come to be that you made a vocation out of surfing? I mean, for most people, it would be their absolute dream to take the sport that they loved. I mean, you know, I think only 3% of people that try to make a professional sports team actually make it. So you can imagine there's literally hundreds of thousands of high level athletes that dreamed about making their, their love and their passion into a career, but only a very few make it. I'm could you share how it is that you successfully turned your passion into a, a career, into a life? Well, I, I mean, I, I think that that's, you know, I, I think there, that, 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 you know, it's part of it is still perplexes me to this day, you know, and sometimes uh, I think the talking head song, you know, how did I get this fine house and this fine wife? I mean, you know, I look at my life sometimes and, 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 and awe of the fact that I have made a, you know, made a life from my passion and, 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 and not only did it, was I, have I've done that, but I completely, uh, went, uh, you know, an obscure route. So it wasn't even like I got into a system that was there and, and was able to, I kind of created my own, uh, way, you know, and it, it, I, I mean, I, I think it, you know, there's a couple things that, you know, the, the not being discouraged by failure, I think not being uh, discouraged by, by other people's, you know, you know, their, their comments or, you know, I can remember growing up and, you know, uh, I had a, you know, like the older men that I looked up to and the one, you know, the one guy says, you know, Hey, you know, Hey boy, you're not going to be able to eat your surfboard. That's what he used to tell me. And, you yeah. know, you're not going to be able to eat your surfboard. And so I, you know, the uh, not being discouraged, I think not just just kind of Gabby calls it the terrier, you know, the the dog that just does not just the relentless pursuit, the belief you can, you know, the, the ability to believe it's possible, even when maybe you haven't seen it or there's not even a real, uh, you know, and the willingness and the willingness to to, to do you know, anything, any, any, any other things to keep you being able to do the thing that you, that you want, you know, not just like 
being so proud that you just like, well, I will only do this. And that's the only way I do it because you might never get to do it if you do that. So, you know, I think there's a, you know, I think there's a, you know, I think there's a, a universal plan that's out of your hands as well. I, I, I feel like there's so many factors that play into, you know, first of all, the miracle of life and how does it, you know, how it even exists. And then, you know, these are, these are like other depictions of that, you know, other depictions of the miracle of existence, but, you know, having a, having a, having an idea, having a dream, you know, be, believing that, you know, convince, believing in it, believing that you can do it and, 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 you know, pursuing it and, and, and not being discouraged and having fortune, uh, you know, fall, fall your way. And, and, uh, I mean, I think there, like I said, I think there's so many ingredients in that recipe, right. I, but there are some fundamental things that you have to have. And I think all stories like, like mine or like these have that, you know, you just, again, like I said, the, you know, the lack of being discouraged, the ability to continue relentlessly to pursue, um, you know, having that, that, that faith and believing that you can and, and, uh, you know, and, and, and again, having the fair, you know, the fairy dust, having, having the fortune to, to fall on you as well, because there's, you know, there's always someone as talented or as strong or as smart. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's, uh, and, and timing, I think timing is, you know, you, you maybe you wouldn't have been able to, you know, 20 years before and you couldn't maybe 20 years later. So I think that there's, you know, all of those, there's all those kind of factors. Yeah. You know, I, <clears throat> as you can imagine, um, many times in my life to feed my family, uh, you know, cause I was a father when I just turned 18. So neither of our parents had any money. So there was times I had to do whatever I had to do to make a living, but and keep food on the table and, and create some safety and security. But there, there was always a visceral sense of when my compass bearing was not due north towards what my heart and passion was calling me to. And so though I was making money, I was immediately scouting to see how can I find my way back to my path. And I tell my students and my patients and my clients to always remember that a labor of love is sustainable, but anything else is just labor. And the question is, how much of that can you sustain before you become disgruntled, sick, or you know, unhappy to the point that it's costing you money and you're in some doctor's office getting offered pills? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the the truth the truth is is that that if you're you know, I, I think, and I, and I and I talk to my kids about this and I try to show them through, you know, through my, through my actions and, and because the words seem to bounce off of them many of the time, but uh, you know, I, I, I try to show them, you know, that what it looks like to have something that really brings, brings you real fulfillment, like real, real peace or, or real accomplishment or, you know, or whatever, you know, or, and in a way, you know, that contentment, like the thing that can bring you a certain level of contentment, um, you know, what that looks like, how, you know, Hey, just, this is what it looks like. Cause I get that from, you know, my love of the ocean and, and my, and my, uh, you know, and also too, I get that also from the fulfillment of, of kind of doing new things The create, there's a creative, you know, like an artist. I mean, I think I describe my work, um, a lot like an artist that, that, you know, it doesn't matter uh, what people, you know, if some people don't like it or not, um, as long as I'm getting fulfillment from the, from the, the, the act of doing the art and the self-expression and, and then you let the chips fall where, where they may. And if people like it, uh, incredible. And if they, if they don't, well, you're still okay too. And, and to have the kids see that I think is important so they can find their, you know, they can find their special thing or the thing that does that. And hey, listen, I would subsidize my, my passion with anything. Um, but I would need to continue to do that thing that brings me the most, you know, the most fulfillment, uh, other than, you know, of course my, my family and, and then of course my own sanity. 
Yeah, well, that you know, th- that's how we maintain our sanity. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the deep wisdom of Laird Hamilton today. As you may have heard, Laird shares a deep appreciation for high-quality organic food and believes in the importance of making great, nutritious food available for everyone. If you'd like to add real certified organic nutrition to your diet that's easy to use, fast, and nutritious, there's no better place to start than with Organifi. Organifi offers a wide variety of excellent, good-tasting, easy-to-prepare superfoods, protein powders, and drinks that my family, friends, and clients love and use regularly. You can taste and feel the nutrition right away, and I know you'll love Organifi's great products. Go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, and on checkout, use the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20, to get your 20% discount. To get to know Drew Canoli, the founder of Organifi, listen to my podcast, episode number 64, Drew Canoli, UBU. Enjoy Organifi. Laird, I, you and I are pretty close to age. I'll be 59 in August. How old are you now? I'm 56. 56. Okay. I didn't realize I was uh, that many years older than you. Um, all three of them, Paul. So, it, yeah. Yeah. I thought I for some reason I thought you and I were actually closer like within a couple of months. I don't know where I got the idea from, but uh either way the point I'm driving at is that both of us have been doing really what we wanted to do and chose to do for our whole lives and we've certainly overcome plenty of challenges to get to this moment right now. I'd love it if you could share some of the biggest challenges you've faced in your life and a few of your biggest challenges as a big wave surfer? Like what are some of the things where you really found your edges and how did you, how did you center yourself? Well, you know, I, I think, I think, uh, you know, the biggest challenge and it probably continues on to this day is just the patience, uh, to, to let things, you know, happen at the speed in which they're going to happen. And, you know, you want everything, especially when you're young, you just want it now, you know, you just, this second I need it now and and you think that right but but you know having that patience and that ability to 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 wait you know to to be to to understand there is a timing and the timing that you think that you need is not necessarily the timing that you actually need so I think that that's you know that that's been a a huge thing but the challenge you know I mean listen I can say uh you know I can say that the, you know, in, in surfing itself, it's been, it's been, uh, you know, some of it's been injury, you know, that the challenges of being hurt and then wondering if you're gonna, you know, if you're going to be able to be whole again, and you're going to be able to perform at the level, um, that you, you, you know, that you can, but I think the, the, the most, you know, the biggest part is just retaining, you know, retaining the mental kind of, like you said, the balance and the mental center, you know, the mental equilibrium to, about keeping things in perspective and understanding. And, you know, uh, I worked with an old Korean man once, you know, and he said, when good times here, don't be too happy because after good time, bad time. But when bad times here, don't be too sad because after the bad time, the good time comes again. And so, you know, it doesn't mean be numb, but there is something to be said about you know, being like, yeah, yeah, you're going to miss some, you're going to get some when you get them, don't be too like zealous about it. And, and, and when you lo- miss, you know, when you, when you miss, when you get them, don't, don't be too proud. And when you lose them, don't be too sad. And, and, and there's something to be said about, cause you're going to get another round, you're going to get another chance. And I think that's where patience comes in. You know, I think that, that, that definitely having hope and, you know, I know that, that, uh, that, you know, to, to, to keep evolving, uh, as a person, I think that's been something that I've really, uh, desired, you know, and, and not, and, and not let your ego drive you in your, in your, in your focus so that you're not derailed by that. And, you know, going back to prove that you can do something that you've already done in a way that you don't, if you, you know, that you're satisfied internally, but somehow you need to, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be de- kind of distracted or just drawn away from your, you, you know, your path. You know, I think that that's a, I mean, listen, I, I've dealt with, you know, I, I believe that there's physical manifestations of every emotional or spiritual uh, kind of 
belief or concept or struggle. I mean, you just, I, you know, it's like why teachings are in parables because it's, it's easy to f- show physical, the physical aspect of some spiritual concept. And, and so, you know, you see that the, ch- you know, you see these physical cha- I mean, I've been involved in physical challenges and, you know, that, that of course, whenever life risking, um, activity is involved with things it really brings you back to really being you know appreciative of 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 being alive and 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 it and it keeps you keeps you you know humble and and it it just keeps your perspective clear you know and i i think i think not you know it's important to not uh listen um to you know i always say don't read your own press but it's important not to just be so influenced by you know, your peers, I think there's a, there's a time and a place and to, to have that influence you, but you, you need to be, you know, I just, I was reading something to earlier, uh, yesterday, just, and it's, it's, it's something that I've read when I was young, but it just a, a continual reminder that, you know, you are, you are the, uh, you know, you, you are the company you keep. And, and so I think that that's, you know, that, that losing people you care to, care about like losing those relationships in order to keep evolving i think that's a challenge i think you know i mean i've dealt i've dealt with uh you know enjoying red wine and having alcohol be something that was like that that was enough of a challenge that i made a decision that one day to just be done having drinking any alcohol just because it was more of a discipline thing so you know i think there's a formula to the 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 processes of overcoming barriers. I think there's, there's a way to, to implement a formula to overcome uh, challenges of life. And, 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 and those physical ones also influence the spiritual ones and the spiritual ones influence the physical ones. And I think that the, you know, the two are, are closely knitted together. And I, it's interesting how we love to create this division between them. And I think, I think that's a challenge. I think it's important to continue to bring everything to, you know, back to the whole. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> well, Einstein said the sole governing agency of the particle is the field. And since uh, particles are the basis of atoms, which is the basis of all material existence, uh, it's it's fairly straightforward at this point for anybody that studies that you can't really separate what we call the spiritual world or the world of the invisible with the world of the visible, and that what's invisible is actually what's moving the visible into formation and animating it. So um, it's it's always interesting to me that even today, with you know countless documentaries and books and you know university lectures and people like Richard Feynman and Einstein and a long, long list of others that people actually still uh, can't see the interrelationship between the material world and the invisible or spiritual world. And when you don't have that awareness, then you really fall into a a wide variety of traps that can lead to lots of challenging relationships. Yeah. That's a nice way of putting it, Paul. (laughs) (laughs) Um. I know you came out with your Laird Superfood company and you've got a nice line of superfoods, coffee, creamers, and other products. I'd love it if you can share an overview of your philosophy on diet yeah. um, and and how that relates to your products. So, you know, it, it's interesting that you asked that because it's, you know, we've been having a lot of conversations and, you know, kind of internally within the business. And, you know, one of the, one of our, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like, it's important to have some sort of governing philosophy around your life and just in general. And I think, you know, the, the company has been adopting kind of my personal um, beliefs uh, and, and, you know, in, in just in life, but it's, you know, just, I mean, first of all, honesty and, uh, you know, kind of having open, kind of having, uh, you know, transparency, especially when you're, when you're feeding people something that they're taking into their bodies or into their minds for that matter. Um, and, you know, and it may be just the truth for you. It may be something, you know, that, that, but, uh, you know, and, and I think, you know, and, and I, I'd say that you've, you've contributed, uh, towards, you know, aspects of my philosophy over the years and, and, uh, you know, and, 
I, I, you know, whole food, I'm, I'm really into kind of whole food ingredients. I think that's really important. I think in, in nature, we, we can find the things that we need. And, and, and I believe that, that there are the cures for the, for the, you know, the illnesses that are there, um, in nature and, and, and that a lot of us are, are you know, are, are, uh, you know, mal, malnourished, uh, and, yeah. I, and I, and I connect, I, I connect to, to nourishment and, and to, to getting the minerals and getting the fats and getting the thing, you know, the quality ingredients that you, that people need to ultimately feel better and then be better and think better. I think, yeah, again, we, you know, as you stated, it's all part of the field. It's, you know, I, I think that if you're, if you're not eating well and, and you're not sleeping and you're not getting being physical and you're not, you know, getting your spirit fed and, and getting your, your, you know, get, if you're not taking care of all of the spokes in the wheel, that the wheel just doesn't roll properly. And so that's kind of the, you know, the, and then, and then, and then there, you know, you have a responsibility to the environment. Um, you know, you have to, we just have to, we can't continue to do things like we've done them for, uh, as long as we have. And, 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 and we see the repercussions of that, that the, you know, the, the, the world, the, the earth itself has a, has a, has a, you know, it's sick. Like people ask me about the environment and I'm like, it's sick. Like the ocean, the, the world feels a little ill. Like the temperatures are crazy. The seasons are all mixed up. The, you know, we just have a lot going on and, and so that's kind of, you know, when it comes to, to superfood and then it's just stuff that's authentic to us, that things that we use, that we believe in all of our stuff is functional based and it's, and we're trying to make it affordable. You know, we're trying to make things affordable so that people that can't afford good nutrition can access these products because we believe that they're the ones that are in the most need, you know, the people, someone like yourself or, 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 my, or, or you know, me, we're, we're fortunate to have the information available to us. We have the access to, we have the, the, the resources to be able to get, you know, these things and, and even more exotic stuff that, 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 you know, people have never heard of and may never even come across. And so I, I'm trying to do like the trickle down effect of, of taking something that would be considered a niche concept where it's just unique for people that are highly educated within the field that really love it. And then bring that into the masses, bring that into people that can really benefit, um, in, in, in a real way. And, you know, so, I mean, things from you that I can remember, you know, when we talked about years ago, talking about lettuce and, you know, a lettuce to have the nutritional value today from 20 years ago, you need like 20 heads and you know, all that yeah. kind of, all that kind of stuff. We, we use that as our, like, Hey, we know people need minerals. We got to get them minerals. Hey, we know people need, you know, they need the, these, these, they just need, they need, you know, more potent uh, you know, and, and, and not, and, 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 and not through, you know, supplementation, but through food that, that is something that tastes good. It has to be good. And it has to, it has to be, you have to meet people with where they are. And, and, you, you know, if you talk about, uh, Hey, you know, Hey, just stop drinking soda. Well, if somebody's drinking soda every day and they're, they gotta stay, their palate is at a level where, you're not going to tell them, you know, to, 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 to try she legit or something. I mean, they're not going to drink some exo exotic thing that tastes like mud that, that I. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She legit is definitely an acquired taste and it's not cheap either for the exactly. good stuff. So, so, it, it, so you're, so knowing that we go, okay, we know that. So now we have to meet them with where they are. So then we have to make things that taste really good. And then within that, we can, you know, and I do that with my kids. I mean, I make them a, you know, I'll make some, you know, I'll make them some smoothie, but inside the smoothie, I'll put, you know, you know, I'll put black mountain ant powder and moringa and a bunch of other stuff that by themselves, they would never touch, but disguised with a few, you know, a few fresh berries and some ice and, you know, and a little honey, all of a sudden they're just drinking it down. Um, and so, in, in a way it's that it's kind of that too, where, you know, not deceptive, but also just an opportunity for people to, to really be able to consistently consume some of these things that are really going to, you know, and then, and then they see a, you know, and then over time through this education, then they can get more and more exotic as they feel better and their body start to crave, you know, these, these, these things they actually need instead of, 
instead of craving things that are designed to make them crave, you know? Yeah. You're creating what I teach in my system as a rainbow bridge, how to get from say, uh, really a lousy diet, maybe addiction to sugar to progressively getting to a whole food diet. And so the rainbow bridge is maybe the five or six progressive steps that we take to make the transition, you know, doable, but so it doesn't create more psychological stress than is sustainable. Yeah. And, uh, so, yeah, so it sounds like you're really doing a good job of creating some rainbow bridges. Well, and, 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 um, and also within that, still, still making the products m- more than good for, for the, you know, the super, the super, I, I wouldn't say snobby, but the, the, you know, the people that are highly educated, well-informed and understand again, you know, I have a, I, I have a belief that, you know, what's good for the goose, good for the gander. Like it, like in, in, in my opinion, true real sustainable fitness real sustainable nutrition has to be full spectrum so the kids have to be able to do it the children the old people have to do it the adults have to, everybody has to be able to do some aspect of it because if it's so specialized it just you and you me and our three buddies are the only people that can do it i question the sustainability of that i question if that's something that you, we can really do until we're a hundred, you know what I mean? And if the little kids can't do it and, and, and our grandparents can't do it, I, you know, some aspect of it, I, I, I question the validity of it. Yeah. It, it becomes more of a, uh, kind of a, almost like a fashion fad type item that's here today and gone tomorrow, like exotic high heeled shoes, a handbook yeah. or something well, like that. You fitness, know, it's not- you see that in nutrition, you see that in, in fitness as well. Like you see these, you see things yeah. where it's, it, it, you know, they're, 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 I wouldn't say elitist, but there's something, there's an aspect to them that are like, it, it's just not, it's just not something like you said, it'll be a little bit trendy because at the end it'll be trendy as a result of the fact that it's really not for everybody. And so that will eventually eliminate its process because at one point you're going to be young, you're going to be in the middle and then you're going to be at the end. So everybody's going to experience one aspect of that. You know, every, uh, everybody's going to be in that one stage at one point in their life, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, Gabby sent us a nice package of, of, uh, your various products. And unfortunately with my food intolerances, I can't consume any of them, but I can tell you that, uh, Angie and Penny and the kids certainly love them and I have them here. Yeah. So when people come to spend time to coach with me and, Often, you know, I have people sometimes staying typically anywhere from a week to two weeks and I have a whole kitchen here and just like I had at the Heaven House. So I have your products here for them and and, and I've never had anybody say anything, but damn, I love this. This is really good. No, we've had, listen, we have a, 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 like I said, we have a lot of love with, with those products. We have a lot of people really enjoying the products on a consistent basis. And again, because there, there's good stuff in the in the products and, and, uh, and there's, and the fact is, is that even for you as sensitive as you are, there's a couple products guaranteed for you because we, you know, we are the diversity of our product line and the continual growth, uh, makes it, I mean, that's our whole idea is we're going to get you somewhere at some point, we're going to create something that, that even sensitive Paul check is going to be able to have it. (laughs) Well, I love you. My mouth is open waiting for you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I know that you're all aware of the importance of vitamin C. There is a mountain of research on it, but not all C is created equally. I love Paleo Valley's Essential C Complex because it is the real deal, bioavailable. And I wanted you to hear right from Autumn Smith founder of Paleo Valley, why their Essential C Complex is so unique and something you definitely want for your family and your children. Autumn, tell us about your Essential C Complex. Well, I was shocked to learn as a holistic nutritionist that 90%, over 90% of the vitamin C on the market is derived from genetically modified corn and then it's processed with highly volatile acids. And so I knew I had to find a better way to get all of the powerful benefits of vitamin C. So what I did was I dove into the research and I found the three most vitamin C rich superfoods on the planet. That's unripe acerola cherry and camu camu and omla berry. And then I just packed them into capsules. And the benefits are amazing because 
because you're not only getting vitamin C, but all of the other wonderful benefits that come from these amazing superfoods. So to get access to this complex, all you have to do is go to paleovalley.com and you can use the code CHECK15 at checkout. That's lowercase C-H-E-K 15 and you can save 15% off. I'm just curious because there's all this lately, as you know, with the Game Changers documentary and this is like heavy, heavy bent towards veganism and vegetarianism. And I did my podcast series titled The Honest Vegetarian to try to, you know, put some common sense, light wisdom and experience to that. But I'm curious, what is it that you use as your internal mechanism or compass for knowing what to eat, how much to eat, because, you know, I I don't get the sense that you follow a diet. I mean, I've worked together with you long enough to, 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 and, and I know you well enough, I think that you're probably more like me, but what is it that you use to say, okay, I need less meat and more vegetables, or I need to fast for a day, or I need to uh, jack the fat up, or, you know, how, how do you, how do you guide that from someplace other than an intellectual process that runs the risk of being an ism. I I mean, I, you know, I would say instinct in like intuitively, like my relationship with my body is something is, is that as, you know, I would hope is intimate enough to kind of be like, yeah, like maybe I just don't need to eat. Like, I just feel like I don't need to eat and not ignore that and be like, okay, I'm on a, you know, like I'm supposed to eat now or I'm trying to do this. So I got to do, you know, just, I, 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 you know, and I, I, I talk about, listen, I talk about the relationship with your instincts and your intuition, uh, in, in a, in a, in a, in a, you know, and, and, and then we just go, first of all, we do have some kind of overriding governing, uh, you know, I would say philosophies, but also just, Hey, listen, if, if, if you know, we want to know if it's, if it's, you know, exotic and, 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 you know, is it wild harvested? Is it, I mean, these, some of these things make it a shoe in, right? Yeah, like you just know, like, Hey, you know, they, they, they harvest these, you know, these things off of these wild grown trees in a jungle. I'm like, I'm in like that. You're just, you know, you, you got me, um, you know, and, and, and also I don't, I don't want to be too sensitive. So I want to have the ability to kind of consume, to be able to, to, you know, be able to eat things. If I ever get put in a position that I'm, you know, not able to get the quality of ingredients and and the ingredients are the foods that I, that I normally eat. I want to be able to go and, and consume, you know, something horrific or not eating anything for a day, two day, three days, whatever, how long that is. I mean, just have that kind of that flexibility, like a, you know, I say flexitarian, but like a, you know, something, something that get, allows you the flexibility to kind of be able to, um, you know, be able to survive. I mean, it, you know, the fact is we're an amazing, an amazing, uh, you know, creature, I, I, you know, I mean, that we can, the way we can, what, I mean, when you see, things that people consume and live off of and live for a long time off of you it's you're it's 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 amazing like it, i mean if you tried to put you know feed a uh, a car that or a rocket ship or a boat i mean these things would be destroyed they'd just be dead they wouldn't go anywhere and we can just keep rolling um you know and that speaks to that speaks to our ability to, you know that that air is the huge resource of ours that we that we use for fuel that water is a you know and that we have magnetic, you know, I mean, just, there's so many things that feed our system that, that allow us to get away with our misbehavior within our nutrition. But I think, you know, eating too much, uh, listening to your, you know, listening to your gut. I mean, why do they call it gut instincts? Like, you know what, yeah. that, I just know when I eat that, I'm going to feel terrible. Don't eat it. Like, you know, or, you know what, I really crave that. And, and, and that's not a giant chocolate cake. I mean, when you have cravings of real things, like, why do you, so uh, again, having that kind of a relationship uh, with, with, with your body. I mean, listen, I do, I do. Uh, I mean, I think that, that, you know, and my business is all plant-based because, because we know that you, it's, it's, it's in, you can't build the products and and make and do these things that we want to do uh, with the environment and given the 
the present techniques that are getting used out there. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're plant based and, and, and all of our, and we know that. And, and you know what, 99% of, of the people that consume our products, they need that. They need what we have. And again, it's, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we have things like calcified sea algae, right? That, that, that has the most bioavailable minerals and calcium. So it's kind of like, okay, but is that a plant? Well, then actually it's almost like a type of sand. You know what I mean? If you talk about, you know, uh, Legit, and that's like a tar made in the earth that comes out of the ground. I mean, these are, these are some plants that were at one point, but they've almost changed into other things. So I, I just think that, I think people need to be more open in, in, and, and I think variety, you know, I think, and, and I, and I think this is one of the things that you and I have talked about over the year that how important variety is that, that, you know, we used to consume hundreds of veg, you know, hundreds of types of vegetables. And now we consume three or five, or they, I think we can only name 30. I mean, something crazy like that. So the truth is, is that, I think diversification, I think, I think sporadicness, I think, you know, again, back to, I use, I'm always using the formula, like, Hey, same thing in fitness. Like don't do the same workout every day, all the time. I mean, throw it up, go swim, go bike, go run, go, you know, lift this. I mean, stretch. I mean, I just think that there's, you know, I think the more stuff the, our, we, our bodies really like it when we throw stuff at it. Like we want it, we, we, we throw those curve balls at it. I mean, we don't emotionally like it, but the body responds well to it. It just seems like our bodies respond well to, diver, you know, diversity. And, and, uh, and, and I think that's, you know, that's, uh, that's something that, that, that we don't do enough of and that because it's uncomfortable. And I just think it is, you know, that's a big piece. I think people, you know, they're normal, they're normally consuming out of comfort, you know, and I, I always explain, I, I grew up that food was fuel. Like, you know, when you grow up in Hawaii and you grow up where, where, you know, food is, you just look at food differently because you eat certain stuff and, you know, you all of a sudden it gives you a ton of energy, you know, you eat these limpids and it's like, we just are like, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night, and, you know, and, and, and full of vigor and fire and you're just ready to go. And it's like, and, and you know how you eat a giant meal and there's too many things and you just go, I mean, it makes you, it makes you want to go to sleep or, you know, on Thanksgiving or something like you just, so I, I think that there's a, a, you know, I always, I always like one time when you and I were talking about it, you know, and you said, uh, if it wasn't here 10,000 years ago, don't eat it. The three white devils are white flour, white sugar, and white milk. If you can't pronounce it, don't eat it. But that that part we might have to change because some of these words for this exotic stuff are complicated. But you know, it, it, it's. I think there's some. I like to look at nutrition and in general with a kind of a philosophy, right? Like a hey, you know, have a, a philosophical approach to how we go about eating and not numbers and this and i'm only do that and i only and i don't do because i i you know i always say that never cakes are are really big and and you have to eat the whole thing so when you say never then all of a sudden you're eating a, a never cake and 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 they're and they're 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 hard to get down so uh i i don't i always i always like that you know i always like approaching you know nutrition or even fitness in with those kind of things like hey diversity hey listen to your instincts uh you know, do stuff that you haven't done, try things you haven't done. Yeah. I think a lot of the, uh, problem that we have with issues of food and obesity and, you know, metabolic syndrome and body health actually comes from people not realizing that they're actually trying to use food to feed a part of themselves that is stressed, but they're, actually not hungry for food i tell my students it's always important to remember that the physical body feeds on food the emotional body feeds on emotions and the mental body feeds on thoughts so if we're consuming toxic emotions and feeling disconnected in relationships there's a real tendency for people to try to satiate that disconnection through foods that bring them pleasure or bring them a sense of connection or often foods and drugs become what people find to be the safest forms of love because, you know, a bottle of alcohol never complains about how you kiss it, neither does a cigarette. And so 
I think if people were more in touch with an awareness of what do I really need emotionally right now? Am I hungry because I, my body is hungry or I'm hungry because I'm needing some kind of freedom in my life or connection or do I need to sweeten up my life by finding relationships that are sweeter and more fun because all the cake and all the candies and all the cookies are just making me unhealthy, untired, and maybe obese. And then, as you know, if we don't stimulate our minds and work with new concepts and grow ourselves and expand our awareness, then we can get caught in actually having a real hunger that we actually mistake as a hunger for food. And having worked with too many people to even begin to count with these issues, I found a lot of people's eating problems actually stem more from um, challenges with learning to manage their emotions and learn how to manage themselves in relationships and how to use their mind effectively instead of just doing what they think they have to do to survive in our culture. Absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the fact is, is that I, when I speak about this stuff, um, I, I always, I'm always speaking from, yeah, and that's good, but you can only think about your food once all the other spokes in the wheel are all good. So at the end of the day, you know, you, you, uh, you know, you, you, listen, if you're, if you're, if you're not, if you, if you have issues with the, the you know, the people you love, um, you know, there's no food in the world that can cure that. I mean, the fact, you know, and, and, and the truth is, is that what you really see is, is our consumption, you know, is a reflection, like you said, of trying to fill ourselves with these other things that we're not getting with food. And, and the way we truly know that is just the fact that we just eat too much, that we just, we don't need to eat as much, uh, as, as, as we do. And especially when you start eating better, uh, you, you'll realize you need less. I mean, consumption, you know, you have mass consumption when there's nothing nutrition, you know, there's no nutritional value in it. Then you're going to eat a lot because the body's still going, well, I didn't get anything I need, but, but you have to have, you know, to even have the conversation about, you know, you, how you're eating, you have to, you have to, uh, you know, have the, like you said, the spiritual, the, the, the emotional, I mean, you have to have these, these things have to be getting fed. In, in their food that they need, um, which is not, you know, on a plate. And so the, the, you know, that, that's the, that's the whole, you know, and when we talk about, you know, well, wellness or lifestyle, we talk about lifestyle and health and wellness and lifestyle. And, you know, I mean, listen, like we can just go to sleep. Like if you're not sleeping properly, at least, a, you know, eight hours a night, you, there's got, you're going to have a bunch of issues from that. And then you're probably going to eat things you don't want to. And if you're having issues within your relationships and if you're not willing to be vulnerable and get hurt, then you can't really have love. And then if you, you know, it's like you, if you just go through all those, you know, and again, a lot of it has to go, has to do with discomfort. It goes back to discomfort again. You know, discomfort in the ice, discomfort in the heat, discomfort eating stuff that doesn't taste as great, discomfort or eating something new that you haven't eaten, and then the discomfort in a relationship. Here we are back at discomfort again. I mean, the truth is there are aspects of these things that help you with the other aspects. So the truth is, is that probably through your diet and eating some different things and 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 putting yourself in a position to be vulnerable will actually help you with the vulnerability and other aspects of your life is I believe, I believe there's certain formulas that, that help you, you know, your ability to be uncomfortable is uncomfort. Un, discomfort is discomfort. Let's just, whether it's discomfort in a relationship, discomfort in front of, you know, speaking in front of a bunch of people, discomfort in this ice tub, discomfort, in, you know, with this, this, you know, uh, th this, this beverage or something. I mean, I just think that there's an inner relationship with those that help you build strength. I think the system was set up like that. It's all, it, it, it and it, it's in order to help us through things. If we have an issue within that field, we can use other aspects to help support us. Yeah. There's no question that a, there's no such thing as love for person, place, or thing without some kind of pain and there's no question that pain is the great quickener of consciousness so if we get too complacent um 
if we live too flat line a life, if our routines get too stuck, I think our soul uh, allows us to carry the ramifications of our choices, knowing that ultimately we can all only take so much discomfort before we have to either change our beliefs and our behaviors or go get help from somebody that has more depth of life experience, knowledge, or skill that can see what you're not seeing. And then you have to trust that person enough. That's one of the big challenges in relationships, in my opinion, is that, you know, everyone wants to have their soulmate, but they don't realize that when somebody really loves you, they usually love you enough to be honest about where your shit is and how bad your farts stink. But if you aren't ready for that level of love, then you'll deny and consider it criticism or react negatively to it when ultimately it doesn't matter if it's a love of ice cream or a, a love of meat or a love of anything. Ultimately, there's a dynamic interplay, as you said, of all the factors, be they physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, environmental, family, uh, you know, it's a very, very complex weave. And I think if we get too passive, then we actually risk not growing with the fact that everything's evolving. You know, as Buddha said, the only universal constant is change, but the ego seems to have a real problem with change and likes to medicate itself. But that just doesn't work with the universe. It just, it brings you up against yourself. Well, and I, I you know, and I think that that's why, uh, it's so important to have a relationship with nature. I think that that's, that, that, that's why what Nate, that's what, I mean, nature, it, in my opinion, you know, at least in, let's say in my experience that nature, uh, is, is, is always changing is always, you know, it's like, we always talk about waves where they're, you know, there's no two waves the same at the same spot on the same day. I mean, it's just they're just they're, uh, the, the waves are always, you know, every snowflake's different. So nature, ha everything's always different. And there's a certain, you know, there's a certain kind of submission uh, that nature forces uh, us into that helps us submit to these other that it, it, it actually it seemed and I don't know, I wouldn't say repel, but I think nature definitely puts a dampering on ego. They, they, nature definitely can take ego and put it right in the right spot pretty quick. Which, <laughs> Absolutely. Which I love, no, which I love. It's so beautiful. It's such a beautiful thing because left to our own ego, we're, we're toast. You know, we got no, we have no, we have no chance. But, but when you, when you, when, when nature is involved, uh, it seems to constantly bring everything back to perspective, whether it's just even just looking around and, you know, how, just how, how, uh, you know, how finite we are in amongst this, this uh, creation. If that doesn't work, then, then we can get you into, you know, a giant cliff or a huge wave or something that is, has a little bit more immediacy to it, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Today, you're listening to one of the world's greatest athletes and big wave surfers, Laird Hamilton. We both know how important it is to use supplements to harmonize, not hack the body's incredibly complex systems for optimal health and performance. Did you know that if you take Bioptimizer's masszymes on an empty stomach, they act as proteolytic enzymes, cleaning up dead proteins from your body to support your lymphatic system, decrease inflammation, and speed recovery from exercise? I use them every day for that reason. Bioptimizer's products are at the cutting edge of health and science and ideal for supporting your digestion, metabolism, assimilation, and elimination. That means you get more from your food, your supplements, and you heal faster and perform better. Bioptimizer's enzymes also aid recovery from training, and their Capex enzymes also help stimulate your metabolism naturally. Living 4D listeners save 10% on any order using the code Paul, capital P, -A, and normal, A, just like you write Paul, capital P, A, U, L, 10 on checkout. Go to B I O P T I M I Z E R S dot com and on checkout, use the code Paul10. If you listen to my podcast number 55 with Wade Lightheart, you'll get to meet the amazing co founder of Bioptimizers and you'll gain a lot of great wisdom and deep knowledge about how enzymes work and why they're so important. Enjoy. I'm curious, and I, I, I have an intuition that the answer to this is going to probably be fairly similar to me. Um, 
I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share if if there's one sort of overarching theme or life lesson that you have to keep in your awareness because it it is your, your most likely way of getting trapped in yourself or or um pretty much there what what is the one thing that if you don't keep in your awareness you're most likely to to generate resistance either in yourself or in your relationships or in your life that's a good question I, you know I, and I, I i if you just when you ask that my my initial uh my initial thought immediately and and maybe i didn't digest it enough uh or, or maybe maybe you know it seems that that your first your first thing is usually uh, right correct <laughs> but you know the thing i think that just to, to not to not listen to the, the the little voices in your head the ones that that the ego is involved with you know that the one that 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 makes you uh feel like you know like to not have to to do what you've done to not have to maybe be how you've been um you know all of, all that thing to, to not have to you know to not have to to not be victim to that right to not to, to be okay to to just be yes it's a it's a it's a razor's edge that one right there i totally agree with you it's it's easy to fall into guilt and shame and woulda, shoulda, coulda, didn't type thinking. But I think each of us, every single living human being and every single creature in nature, right to the plants and the trees and the rocks, no two of them are the same. But I believe that the divine cosmic puzzle places each person in its unique position with its unique characteristics and imbalances that ultimately add to the whole. I tell people, if you can imagine that God created the universe and printed it onto a thousand piece puzzle, and you put that puzzle up against a wall, but you took one piece out of it, even if it was eight feet square, where would your eyes immediately go? And everybody says, right to the missing piece. So I say to everybody, remember, you are one of those pieces and you were put there by the universe and by whatever created the universe, because you yourself cannot objectify how you got here or how you became the person that you are. Ultimately, the deeper you go into yourself, the more you find yourself as one with all that is. So it just creates a mystery. So the way I help people deal with that is just celebrate your uniquenesses and even be appreciative of, of the things that maybe you're aware that you would like to improve and, and work on them, but don't make a pathology out of them or you just become a neurotic or a hypochondriac or somebody that's really hard to be around. But I think every one of us is a genius and every one of us has the imbalances that are necessary to make us functionally beautiful. Well, you know, I, I love different, but equal to, and I think comparison, I think we have to be careful of, you know, can, what do they say? Comparison is the death of happiness. But, you know, I, I think different, but, you you know, like you said, the uniqueness equal to, but different, that we're, there's an equality amongst all that exists and how to say what's one's more valuable or less valuable than another one. I, I wouldn't even begin to be in, understand who could even be in a position to do that. Um, but I, but I, I, I do love, you know, people too, but different and, and, and whether it's a child or your, or a grandfather or, 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 or anybody in between equal to, but different. And, and, uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's an amazing, it's an amazing, I mean, the, the, the fact that there, there can be just, and yet within it, there's these, that, that we have some very similar things you know that's why i said equal to di and, and different because of that because there's some there that there's some things about us that that innately that there that there are things that all of us really truly you know seek and desire and will bring us all a similar reaction you know within within our all of our differences there are there are you know i think that that when everything is in line that you know that we all uh, want to be loved. We all want to love. We all, you know, we all want to serve. We all want to be served. I mean, it's, you know, there's just some things that, that, 
that know that, that that all of us have that that and 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 that's a that's an amazing uh an amazing system <laughs> I, I actually think that you've just put your finger on the pulse of what's really missing in the awareness of people that are involved in all the the racial tension that's going on, and and um, it, it's you know as you can imagine, I've had all sorts of people reaching out to me for my opinions on this stuff, and I've tried to just not get too involved because almost anything you say to people with polarized viewpoints just creates more polarity. But I think that, you know, I, I personally am astonished that we're still having these kinds of problems. And I think it's really sad, for example, when people have racial biases. But then it's just as sad when people retaliate, not realizing that they're actually hurting the very people that they say they love, like looting stores and burning shit down and not even knowing who owns the place, only to realize later that it was, it was somebody of your same color, your same uh belief system that you just destroyed their property over some issue, which is you know, really, uh, it's kind of like two wrongs don't make a right sort of idea. And I just think that if people would just celebrate that whatever it is that creates universes, planets, organisms, animals, plants, trees, and people creates us all. And therefore, if we look at our common needs, we we all bring something unique to each other. I mean, what would the world be like if we had not mixed races? If we had, were all still pure Japanese, pure Chinese, pure uh, white people, pure uh, Eskimo, etc. You, know, you know, in Steiner's teachings, he said that the reason that race mixing occurred was to produce diversification, strengthen the genes, and allow us to have different viewpoints on how to live that we would never have had if we would have remained in isolated, uh, you know, pure races. And I think that if people would just celebrate the uniqueness, I mean, I can't even imagine what my life would be like without Cuban food or Mexican food or, you know, uh, you know, one of my, I, I love dancing to Chebby Sabah. I think he's Pakistani. You know, I listen to music from all over the world um, I, I, I'll never forget when I was, uh, it was a long time ago. You might remember when Elton John first came out that he was gay and all sorts of my friends and people that I hung out with started saying, Oh, he's a gay fuck, man. I'm not going to listen to his music anymore. And I looked at him and said, what the hell is wrong with you? Yesterday you liked his music. You played it in your car, you danced to it, you sang to it. And just because he has a different sexual orientation to you, all of a sudden you don't want to listen to his music. I said, how in the world do you get to be that unconscious? <laughs> I'm like, what is going on? But I, I, I just think my point that I'm making is I think that what you just shared really is if we had more of that realization, we wouldn't have a lot of the problems that keep reemerging. Well, I mean, listen, it's, it's when I think about what you said and I think about just everything that's going on, I mean, there's a combination of a couple of things, but it's, you know, it's fear, right? It, fear, it's yeah. fear and it's, and it's, and it's pain, right? And, and fear and pain, they kind of live together. Uh, and, and I think that, that, you know, that 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 is you know there's a lot of people that are in in a lot of pain and and then there and there's a lot of people that are highly scared and you know like like I said before uh, you know uh, when you talk about change and doing something different eating something different doing a different workout like these this is the similar thing that's going on uh, just with 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 you know with people. But with belief yeah, systems. Yeah, it's a similar it's a similar thing. People are, you know, people are uncomfortable with different. People are scared of different. People are highly afraid, you know, and I always say I always I, I describe um a lot of the behavior of what's been happening. I go if you ever want to see an animal do something really kind of just stupid, scare the animal. Like get an animal and scare, yeah. scare yeah. the animal really scare it and the, and they run into the walls they run yes they will yep they'll run right into barbed wire fences tear themselves up slice their own necks i've 
So yes, we all, fear, I've seen so it. fear mm-hmm. when you scare, when things are scared and you, and they have fear, they do all kinds of, and that, and that, and, and when I think about that, that really encompasses every, every, all the behavior, all the things that you see. I mean, it, what's happening, uh, you know, in the, in, in, with all, with everything that's going on in, in all, in all aspects, every, every aspect of what's happening right now on, in the world. And it has been for a long time, but it's, it's this fear, right? It's this fear, the, the fear of dying, the fear of different, the fear of, of, you know, weak, uh, superior, the fear of, you know, whatever, just whatever. I mean, just go to, it's just, there's no end to the list of, of, of what people are afraid of. And, 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 and that's driving, that's driving behavior. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, you know, when you see people driving down the highway alone in their car with a mask on, you're kind of like, yeah, you, you must be scared. Like you're scared. You're scared of something. You must be a yeah. very scared person um, because that right there isn't stopping anything from happening. If anything, it's probably leading to, you know, something that's going to, you know, hurt your health. But again, yeah. you know, I, I think, and again, because I, you know, and listen, I've been in, I've been in a few natural disasters. I've had the, you know, the misfortune and the fortune to, to be in some natural, you know, I've been, I uh, have some pretty radical fires. I've been in some massive hurricanes. <laughs> I remember the. I remember you sent me a video of you fighting that fire full on and, and with a helmet on and a fire hose, and I'm like, "Holy shit, man!" Laird is like in the belly of the dragon right now. But the, but, the, but again, and then like I said, I, but my relationship with fear itself, you know, the the because of what I the things that I've done and and did it, you know, I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg. Was it, you know, did I have a relationship with? with fear before and then that made me good at things that were dangerous or did through being drawn to things that are dangerous did i get a better relationship with fear i'm not sure how that went the truth is is that 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 uh, you know that has allowed me a certain kind of uh stillness when when things are in chaos because of the nature of that i've learned through you know experience that when you when things are in chaos or ultimately when things, when you're in danger, which is a form of chaos, I would describe it, you know, that, that I've learned that, that it's a necessity to, 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 to remain calm and re, you know, remain still. And, and it gives you time to make the right decisions and, you know, and all those things. And, 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 and then it gets ultimately, and so that's, you know, that's been beneficial in the, in these times because of the nature of, you know, I, I was, you know, I just, I told people, I go right now, you have to exercise more fortitude, more, more caution, more uh, tolerance. I mean, everything is magnified. And so you, you really, uh, and more empathy and, and, you know, everything is just turned up. It's, I call it the year of 2020 where, you know, everything's real clear, but it's because of the clarity of what's going on. It's just met. It's really, it, it's really turned up and, and, uh, you know, and, and so, but the, but the high, you know, the, the top thing, the, the pinnacle of, of, of fear or the, you know, the, the end of fear, the greatest fear that we have, that there is, that makes it fear death. Is death. Yes. Death, death is the yeah. king. And so whatever your relationship is with death, it's a trickle down effect, right? It's the, if, it, if death is the apex, then everything that trickles down from death will influence every aspect like, Hey, if I don't eat, I'm going to die. And Hey, if I'm not accepted by this group, I'm going to die. And Hey, if I get this disease, I'm going to die. And da, 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 I'm going to die. And you know, it's always goes back to death, right? It's at the end. So, you know, I think, I think, uh, uh, people's relationship, you know, and I wouldn't say, Hey, you know, how did, how is there, how do you have a good relationship with death or how do you have a bad relationship with death? I, I don't really know. I just, uh, you know, what those look like, except you just definitely have to believe that, that there, that death is not the end, because if that is the case, then it kind of makes, um, it, it, it makes it pretty scary, um, here because at the end of the day, we're all going to die and we can die any second, you know, and I always tell people living's easy. Uh, I mean, living's hard, hard, dying's easy. I mean, dying takes us and living, yeah. I mean, living could take a hundred years and it's a lot of work and you got to, avoid death the whole time. And so if you think it, death is the end, then, 
then that'll make life really difficult. Uh, and, and so, but, but it's all goes back to that, right? I, th- I think it all goes back to fear. And then ultimately the apex of, 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 of the greatest fear is death. And then, so how do we, you know, and then how do we trickle back down from there and, you know, get a better relationship with death? Maybe, maybe, you know, which would make you more appreciative of life and make you maybe have a little bit better, uh, you know, perspective, um, on it. And then, and then, you know, and then, you know, how do, I mean, and then pain and then how do we, you know, help people, um, that are, that are in pain. And, you know, I, 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 you know, I, uh, I, I think I'm naturally a, a highly empathetic person. Just my mom, my mother was a, was a, a, an amazing woman. And, you know, she would take in any stray dog, you know, on the street. And, and, you know, I always say she raised, you know, uh, uh, you know, she raised two sons and a few husbands. So, but, uh, you know, I, I think that, that, uh, you know, that that's, that's, it's a difficult task, right? It's a difficult task because fear is the, is the tool being used to, to manipulate us as well. Right. It, it's being, it's absolutely a great, great mechanism of manipulation and control. It's like, what well, I mean, it, we even do it with our kids. Hey, if you don't do that, you're going to get this. Hey, you know, my, Hey, Hey, my yeah. daughter, you gotta, don't, don't crap on the floor. You're going to spank him in the butt. I mean, it's like, <laughs> so it's so it's a, it, and this is some innate this is some deep innate stuff that that can't just be solved in one you know one single moment of like hey i got this idea we'll just do that and that'll solve it i mean this is this is dna this is deep into you know into into our biology uh, yeah it's actually there's lots of things I would feel triggered to share, but I don't want to sidetrack the conversation by going off on a, a discussion of my own ideas. But when I was in my 20s, I studied a lot of the work of Zig Ziglar. Do you remember Zig Ziglar at all? I, don't, I, I probably know his work. I just don't know. I don't. I'm not. Yeah, he famous business guru, but really grounded, uh, a real beautiful a Christian man, but also very grounded in his uh, Christianity, I would say. And one of the things he taught is is fear is an acronym that stands for false evidence appearing yes. real. And, yeah. and every ever since I studied his teachings, I've always looked at all the times I was afraid. I remember one time I was fighting for the uh, championship of the 82nd Airborne Division. And uh, the guy that I had to fight was one of our team members. And I was, uh, at that time, I was, I think, second string in the welterweight class. He was first string. And he had like, I don't know, 350 fights under his belt at 22, 23 years of age. He was ranked number four in the world as an amateur. And I had so much fear of losing to this guy. And with my friends watching and my wife and my kid watching and I remember my corner man, Nathaniel Finch, who was the U.S. Uh, heavyweight champion at the time, saying, Paul, you have got to get over your fear of this guy because you can hit harder than him. You're tougher than him. You're in better shape than him. You better decide right now if you're going to fight or he's going to knock you out. And I got up and said, I've got I've actually I've got a choice right now. I'm either going to get the shit beat out of me or I've got to overcome my fear and just give it my all. And at least that way, I know if I lose, I tried. And I ended up coming out and just after that was like, there was, that was at the end of the first round. And I just fought like a wild man and did my very best and ended up losing a split decision to the fourth ranked boxer in the world, which after that, it was a lesson for me to never be afraid when I get in the ring of anybody, because the fear actually disables me more than the gap between my abilities and, and the, and the opponent's abilities. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to announce Symbiotica's new activated charcoal product. You know, I've been using activated charcoal clinically for many years to help people with things like food poisoning or any kind of significant detoxification issue. But I wanted Sherveen, who formulated the product, to tell us really what's going on with this new product so you know exactly how and why you can use it. Charcoal is a carbon. It's sequestered carbon, negative electrons. We want that in our body. And I wanted to think outside the box. You know, we've been using charcoal for the last 10, 15 years over on the island. We actually make it um, through our fire and through our coconut shells. We decided to use coconut shells for this product. And it's in a Myron glass bottle and it's with liposomes. That is something different. 
We don't see that on the market. So it's something that you can use. You can put it in your bag. You can carry it with you. And if you eat food that causes a little bit of distress or you have gas or bloating or anything like that, here comes the charcoal, easy access, and boom, you have alleviation right in your stomach. And then for, you were mentioning too that it's great for the beautification process because so many people don't realize that if your body has more toxins than you can eliminate through urine or feces, it'll come out through your skin. And that's what a lot of people's skin problems are. They don't realize and they keep buying all sorts of topical creams. But this product will help detoxify you from the inside, which will help you beautify your body, correct? 100%. We're in a toxin burdened world. Our organs are taking on so much. You see people with skin rashes, eczema, acne. What is that? That's toxins that the liver couldn't deal with, yeah. that the lymphatic system couldn't deal with. Charcoal comes right in there, does the job. It's an adsorber. So it pulls those toxins in, holds onto them, and you excrete them out. That's beautiful. If you want to get your activated charcoal product, go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com and on checkout, use the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15. And while you're there, look at all their products. They have amazing products. I use them all. I love them. They taste great. They feel great and they work great. And by the way, a liposomal product means that it's wrapped in fat, so it goes through your body more easily. Your body treats it as a food, not as a drug or anything else, which makes it more bioavailable. So enjoy your new Symbiotica Activated Charcoal. Symbiotica.com, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout. I think if a lot of us spend some time, and this is why shadow work is so healthy, really asking ourselves how many times in our lives have we been afraid of something only to find out that it actually wasn't true. Like thinking our girlfriend's cheating or thinking that we're going to go broke or, you know, broadcasting bad news in front of ourselves without actually asking ourselves, is it really true? And I think all of us right now should ask the question when we're watching the media, listening to the special mainstream stuff, we should be asking, is this really true? And uh, a great example of that is I was watching a presentation by a doctor on this whole pandemic thing, and he showed very clearly that they had been using in the media the same pictures of the same emergency room with all these people apparently dying of the virus, yet they were claiming that it was in Italy and in, in different co countries and, and all around the world. And he showed beyond a shadow of a doubt, it was actually the same piece of film that they were making it look like it was happening all over the world, but it wasn't. And the other thing I learned that was really powerful is I studied um, Arnold Mendel's teachings quite a bit. And he's a very, very deep guy. He was a Jungian analyst and a expert in quantum physics. And he developed a whole system called process psychology. And he, he's just a very deep guy, a shaman. And one of the things that he teaches in his teachings is that chaos contains a hell of a lot of information. He, he says, if you study the creation stories from almost all cultures, everyone consistently, not everyone, but most of them say that what we know of as the universe and life came out of chaos. And he says, if you actually hold still with chaos and look at the information being presented to you, it's almost always directing you to an opportunity to create harmony again. But if you run from it or you get paralyzed by it, then you actually delay the ability to come back into balance. Well, that's, I mean, you know, there's a, I love this. I love the, uh, the saying, you know, there's a consistency to chaos. There's a re reliability to chaos. Something about that, that I, uh, I appreciate. And, you know, um, I was just thinking also too about, you know, for me, I think my greatest teacher has been the ocean, you know, and I, and I, I think the the observation of the ocean and what I've learned uh, at in in the ocean and one of the you know one of the sayings that 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 I learned from the ocean that the ocean or one of the things the ocean taught me that I think kind of fits right in with what you were saying and and just what's what's going on right now is just don't don't react to what hasn't happened yet. Yes. It's amen. Like, it's like, uh, you know, you'll be out there and here comes a wave and then you start reacting and the wave hasn't even gotten to you. And you're already responding to this, to the situation because of what you think is going to happen. And then you, and unfortunately, then you have to respond to your response. Uh, and, and yes, yes. And that adds and more complexity. Gets you. Then when the wave finally slams you, then you're, you're in the middle of responding to a response you were going to have 
for what you thought was going to happen. And then you're not really prepared to really take the, you know, the whooping that the, that the wave's going to give you. And it, it, it seemed, you know, it just, it, it's an interesting, uh, process how, you know, I think through, you know, and again, that's why I always talk about nature is that I go back to nature as my greatest, is my greatest professor, but, and through observation, and you just said it there, where if you observe nature, you know, you, you, you're going to learn, right? You're going to learn through observation. If you run, you're not going to learn much. And if you freeze, well, that means you're not observing, you're not going to learn much. And I think, you know, harnessing, you know, what, you know, you talk about, you talked about the boxing match where you, you know, you weren't scared, but maybe it's not that you weren't scared after it's just maybe that you were able to harness it in a productive way. Cause I always say, you know, if you ever want to see what fear looks like when it, when it runs, just watch an antelope run away from a cheetah. And I go, and most of the time the antelope gets away. I mean, some cheetah is the fastest animal in the world, but the antelope gets away most of the time. And that's because it's harnessing fear and using fear as an energy source. And again, you know, uh, there's a great book that uh, Christine Ulmner wrote about fear and uh, it's called the art of fear, but it just talks about our relationship uh, with fear. And I, I really appreciated, you know, one of the, one of the antidotes she gives in the book is she says, you know, you, she, you know, you're a little boy and you go to this water park and then, there's a giant, huge water slide and your dad goes, Hey, you know, you want to go on that? And then the little boy goes, no, I'm scared. And then the dad goes, Oh, you, you shouldn't be scared. And she's like, yeah, no, you should be scared because that thing is designed to be scary. And so <laughs> exactly, <laughs> you could tell your son, Hey, you know what? That thing is scary. Are you ready to be scared? Like, are you in the mood to be scared? Because if you are, we'll go there. And if you're not, uh, don't worry about it. You can do it again another day. And so I think, I, I, again, I think it's important to, you know, that that people, and I, you know, having a relationship with being scared, having a, a relationship with fear, and then harnessing it for the energy um, it, 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 that it has, because it, obviously it's powerful. It's been used in nature. It's been beneficial for us, you know. Uh, I have a theory that, you know, a lot of the reason why we're self-inducing a lot of these fear situations or, you know, why do people like horror films? And, you know, and I'm like, well, why, why are people so attracted to scary films? And I'm like, maybe they, they, they just have a, a, an ass. And there's probably some other reason that, that I don't know about, but this just was what made sense to me was that they are looking for a, a, an outlet, a resource to pull fear from because when we were in nature and living in nature, we were fear, we were scared a lot. We were scared daily. And so, and now we're not at all. And so now we need to like self-induce to fulfill this mechanism. That's still that we retain. You don't just erase that, that bio lot, you know, that, that biology that you've had over, you know, thousands of years in, in one generation, uh, just because we got rid of everything dangerous, you know, and so why, and, and then, and then they're getting, they're, they're activating that system in their, in their, in their body. You know, I always thought, you know what, I don't like scary movies because I, I get scary life. Like I go out in life and I get scared for real in life. And so I don't need to go to a theater and watch something that's scary. I'm good. I got mine, but you know, for a lot of people, they don't get that. And so it is an emotion that people don't have a great relationship with. They don't understand. Um, and, but, but it is obviously a, a dominant force in, in our, uh, you know, ethos It's in our system. Yeah. I think fear is a really great enlivener of awareness. And I think that fear gives us the awareness that, enhances our ability to learn which ultimately produces growth and i think that if we engage fear with a level of intelligence i mean there's a uh, it's one thing to be uh, driving drunk and uh losing control of your car that's just that's not really an intelligent fear that's just stupidity but you know like <laughs> when i worked on the farm and we had to castrate a ram or a bull and here I was like 12 or 13 and my dad saying, hold this thing still. And I'm like, this thing could kick me hard enough to snap me in half. I had to be really aware. And when I was 
racing motocross and stock cars and you doing the things that you do, fear really ramps up your capacity for awareness. And if you work with that capacity and work with your instincts and your intuition, then I find you typically find yourself coming out of the fear, realizing how beneficial it was and how alive it made you. And I tell people all the time, look, if I could t wave a magic wand and take away all the painful times in your life or wave the magic wand and take away all the times you were partying, having fun and everything was hunky dory, which one, if you lost, would take away more of your wisdom? And I've never had anybody not agree that losing all the challenges where they had to face their fears in tough times would be something they would not want to lose because if they did, it would ultimately erase the greatest majority of their wisdom. Well, and, and, and that just fits it right with what you said, that you were all capable of genius. And at the end of the day, I think that that genius can stem from, I think the, the, the fear it can induce genius, right? So at the end of the day, I think that we, that we, if you take, if you, if, if you're exposed to fear and, 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 and fear of failure, fear of embarrassment, whatever, just, you know, wh whatever it is, I, I think that that's where, and, and you've, you've just said it, that that's where all the learning comes from. That's where all the knowledge comes from. You'd never want to take away all those times that you were scared that, that, that all the lessons you learned, well, I think that's where the, you know, that I think that's where genius comes from. I think at the end of the day, you know, I, I, I can't imagine that there's not a, a few geniuses out there in the world that, that were, were scared into it, you know, and some stuff, it's not so, you know, you wouldn't wish it on anybody. People are, people go through things and have things happen to them that you wouldn't wish on anyone. And, and, uh, you know, and, and the pain that comes from those, from that fear, uh, as well. I mean, develops a, a level of intelligence. I believe that, 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 uh, that you just can't, you, you, you can't replace, there's no other way to, there's no other, there, there's, there's, there's no other way to, 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 to move to that level. You know, you talk, you talk about moving, you know, I mean, I, and I believe that's why, you know, at I, 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 one time I was with a, a couple of, or some, some friends of mine had some monks, some monks from Tibet over at their house. It's kind of not a, a usual thing. And they were all, you know, in their outfits and they were monks and we were sitting there and, and, uh, we were all, you know, we were in the Lotus. I was in my version of a Lotus, which looks more like a, you know, kind of a bent paper clip, but, uh, <laughs> but I, but you know, at one point we were there and we're sitting in this position and, and I'm, and I'm uncomfortable and then I'm getting more uncomfortable. And pretty soon we've been there long enough. And I'm like, so at one point I asked the guy, I go, well, I go, you know, Hey, I asked the monk, I said, Hey, when does this, when does this kind of, you know, not get uncomfortable? Like when, at what point, like how long do you do it? Or at what point does this not get uncomfortable? And he looked at me kind of like a little bit puzzled, but and he's like, well, it never, it never, it never, it never, <laughs> exactly. it never doesn't get uncomfortable. It, it, it's always uncomfortable. And he said, it's meant to be uncomfortable because it keeps you present, you know, that the discomfort keeps you present. And, and I, I found that interesting, uh, that, that, that's the objective that they're that the that these yogis or these monks get into these positions and they and I would imagine you have to get more and more elaborate with the position to to keep the pain up because it's like anything you know any kind of workout or whatever you know you you do 10 reps long enough you're pretty soon you got to do 12 reps and then you know pretty soon you got to do 15 and you got to up the weight and you got to you know you got to keep pushing it to get the same result and it's just but it is interesting that that process you know, one thing too, while we're on the topic, I think there's another really important component to fear that a lot of people often don't pay attention to. And I think that fear has a very powerful ability to deepen our faith when we're facing, I mean, when you were fighting that fire and trying to save your house, did it not push you deeper into your faith? be it in the universe or in great spirit or something that was beyond the fire and the immediate um, 
threat. Well, listen, every single death, near death experience that I've had in, in, in my life, every, every, um, you know, every, like either being lost at sea. I mean, why, when you're lost at sea, do you say, you, you say, you know, uh, you know, if there is a God or God in heaven, please bring me back and I'll turn from my sinful ways. Or, I mean, <laughs> like, yeah. like you always, we always go to, to faith, right. At, at, at the, uh, at the end of the day that when, when we are, when we are vulnerable and when we are put in, in you know, every death, in every near death experience that I've, that I've had where our, our, or every, let's just say, can see like every time I thought that I possibly could die, whether I could or not, just, I thought I could, that was all I needed. That always brought me back to faith. That always brought me back to believing, ultimately believing that there is something, you know, more than what is that we can see, um, you know? And so, but yes, I, I, I'm, I absolutely agree that, that the relationship between those, you know, between, between fear and death and faith are, are intimate. I mean, it's, you know, they don't, they don't, uh, they, they, they live, they live together, you know? Yeah. They don't stop holding hands. You know, it, it, it just listening to you and in, in our conversation brings up a thought I'd like to put on the table with you is, you know, I've, as you know, I've, I've done a fair bit of work with plant medicines and, spent years doing research on myself and really, uh, you know, using them to deepen my spiritual connection. And I've had a lot of times where I honestly was so far gone. I didn't even know my own name, who I was. I just merged in with something even beyond the universe that was just, there's no name for it. But I, I remember at times as I was progressively dissolving, really having a huge, massive experience of thinking, oh my God, I'm never coming home. I'm, I've even had the experience of getting in so deep that there was no memory of past or present. There was just this luminous now that can't even be comprehended. And I, I have a feeling that one of the reasons for the reemergence of plant medicines is it's taking us into death simulations to help us really learn more about ourselves. I'm curious, have you had experiences like that? And and what's your thoughts on plant medicines as a means of deepening our, our um, potentially understanding of what the death process is really all about and how that can help us in our life? Well, you know, it, it, it's like I stated earlier, I, I think all, uh, I think all cures and all, uh, you know, all, all things can be healed, uh, you know, through, through plants, you know, or combinations of, and, and, and there, and so on. I, you know, I think my, uh, my, my own, you know, experience of near death experiences is I, I you know, because I've had a, a fair amount, that's probably, you know, discouraged me in, in my own, you know, uh, like I'd say in my own expedition of, uh, of plant, you know, induced death simulation, <laughs> you know, like, like, <laughs> like, 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 I, like, because I've had, you know, like I said, I've had a, you know, I've, I've had a lot of, um, I've had a lot of opportunities to feel like I might die or I might, I might never, um, make it and, you know, and whether they were real or not, um, you know, the fact that you think it's real is sometimes sufficient enough to supply you with that, with that result. But there's no doubt that the, that the resurgence and all the work being done with all of the, of the, of the, uh, you know, plant-based medicines in all the fields, uh, you know, especially when you talk about, you know, when you talk about death and you talk about whether it's with the soldiers or hospice or, you know, all, uh, uh, these, you know, or, or what, you know, or just people with, with, you know, with, with just all emotional and, and, you know, uh, spiritual and emotional uh, injuries. I mean, he, listen, I, I think it's, you know, if everything we know is, let's just say everything we know is nothing 
And so how much is there to know? So, you know, it, it, I think we're just at the beginning of, again, understanding. That's why I always love, you know, uh, the concept of biomimicry and, and, and through the study of, and here we are back at nature again, you know, uh, as the, as the source of all knowledge and all information, you know, and, and then through our observation, our study of it, our use of it, um, you know, we, we learn and, 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 and get connected to the, to the, uh, you know, get connected to the earth ultimately, but get connected to creation because the earth is both, you know, it's the spot where this is, it's what we're, it's, it's our spaceship right now. This is what we're on and in and riding, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I, listen, I'm fascinated. I'm, I'm fascinated by the continual discoveries that we have even today with all of our technology and everything that's happening. And with just the, you know, it's like, a, we're, you know, AI and all this stuff that we're working on. that's so smart. And yet we're still discovering stuff within, you know, within, within nature. And it's right here. And we've only begun to do that. Right. We've only, and it's just the, that that's kind of, there's some irony in that that somehow we were so evolved only to go back around. And, you know, I always use the alchemist, you know, where we, where we go out and search the whole universe and only to come home to find that the treasure was in our yard already. And so it's, it's a little bit like that, you know, it's a little bit like it's here, it's been here. And, you know, we're probably just, and, and again, you know, my earlier quote, like there's nothing new, it's a new application of an old idea. Chances are this stuff's been around you know, humans have been around, plants have been around, we've, it's been being used, a lot of these arts, and these plant medicine, uh, you know, knowledge, has, a lot of the plant medicine knowledge has been lost, I mean, it's like, Hawaii had a whole, they had a whole, you know, group of, within the culture that were all medicine men, based around plant medicines that, that, all that stuff just disappeared. It just, that whole thing. And, and there'll be a resurgence to rediscovering, you know, that like there is right now with, you know, in, in all of the, uh, you know, in, in all the fields, it's, 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 you know, it's, it just gets back to, again, faith and believing, you know, it's, it, in my opinion, I just think it continues that, that if you get a little bit, you know, if we get, as we get, drawn from faith a little bit it seems like in in mod the modern world is kind of drawing from drawing a little bit from faith and going to science i mean and we can go back and forth between the two that as we do that all of a sudden there's like a resurgence of something again only to bring to bring again faith back to the forefront because as we as we realize that that the plant that plants are curing us and can cure us and have this and have this power then we have to go back to creation and be like oh okay well it's a lot more you know i always just say because people ask me about faith and i always just say you know about what i believe i just always say it's too elaborate it's just too elaborate too elaborate too too elaborate to just be you know be of chance to <laughs> yes it is it really is it's uh yeah i mean Oh, I could start on a whole rampage with that one, but I'll do uh, all day. I'll I do mean, that to you all day. I, I know you can always go down the rabbit, the rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a sucker for rabbit holes for sure. You know, one of the things I think too, is we're, we're really at a point in human development where we've developed, I think too much hubris in human knowledge and, and in science and we've actually gotten to the point where we think we know too much without realizing that for everything we do know, there's about a million things we don't know. And I've, in my pursuit of knowledge, and I, I'm, I'm curious what your response to this is. In my pursuit of knowledge, I found knowledge to be what I would call horizontal. Chasing after knowledge, like, I want to know everything there is to know about surfing, or I want to know everything there is to know about the human physiology or whatever. And as I've gone deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into all the things that I have, it's as though the horizon just keeps extending itself. And the more knowledge you have, the bigger the questions you have, and then the horizon jumps back. And you think, okay, I got this figured out. And then all of a sudden, a patient comes in with something that can completely and utterly baffles you 
and you thought for sure you know what was going on. You find out you're not only partially wrong, you're like completely in the wrong ballpark. <laughs> Have you found that the more knowledge you develop, the more the horizon just keeps escaping you? I, I you know, I, listen, that's that's the only that that may be the only thing I know. <laughs> <laughs> you try to surf the horizon. Man, that might be the only thing I know. That might that you know the truth is, you know that old saying: the only thing I truly know is I know nothing. I mean, it, 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 and 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 the, what you know, and what you said about our hubris, about about our intelligence. It, it you know, it, it's so that's the part that I that I fear the most. Right? It's it's great, you know, great uh, pride precedes us the great fall. And it's just, it just, you know, the, the fact that we have the audacity to act like we, we know things uh, is, is, is almost embarrassing to, to the fact that we know anything. I mean, it, it, the fact that we even know anything, it's like the, to say, to even start to believe, but you know, it's again, it's ego, right? It's our, it's the, it's man in his, in his, you know. He thinks he can, you know, he, here he goes again. What, let's watch where he goes this time. Like it, it's like, it's like watching a little kid, you know, learning how to walk. It's like, yeah, here he goes. He's up, he's up. And then, you know, and then he just hard right and boom, he's down again. But it's, I don't know. It, 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 it is amazing. Um, in my opinion, that, that we have the audacity to even, to even consider that somehow we've got any hand on what is to be known, you know, that, 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 and I don't care what, where you go and what you, and what you develop. I mean, it, it just, you know, when you pull back, you know, and you from uh, earth and you pull back into, into what we know, uh, what we think we know, uh, and, 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 and you just, it just, it's, it's beyond. And I, and I, and, and for me, I, 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 I get great comfort in that. I, I get great comfort in relying on that, that, you know, you can't, there is, there is no capable way for mankind to truly know all there is to know. I just, I, I, I and, and I think that brings com me comfort that, that fortunately we're never going to be relying on him or it mankind to, to kind of, you know, oversee what's, or be involved truly in what's happening, no matter what we do and what we do to ourselves and what we do to the thing. I just, I just wouldn't want to rely on our behavior. Um, to, to oversee that. And, you know, and, and I, and, and again, you know, you go back to, you, you go back to faith and, and, you know, and belief uh, and, you know, and I mean, it, it, it's, it's, you know, haven't, haven't we, haven't we observed that before in, in, you know, in, in uh, just in the history of, of, of the different, you know, cultures on the, on earth and just their behavior. And then what, what, you know, and at the end result, they just never, it never works out, you know, but, but, uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, I think that that's that in my, in my, in my mind, I just feel that, that I, I'm, 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 I feel good that, that it is that, that complex and that, that endless, uh, according to what we're capable of, because within that means, in my opinion means that there is something far beyond that's that, that has some sort of, uh, you know, just there's some sort of governing something, some sort of field magnetic, something keeping things, you know, in, in balance. And, and we're not going to rely on, uh, on, on these, on these, you know, poorly behaving children that are running around on the earth. <laughs> Yeah. You know, uh, I, and I don't expect you to elaborate on this at all or any more than you want to, but when it comes to the hubris of knowledge and thinking that you know exactly what's going on and uh, enforcing that on other people with people like Bill Gates and a lot of these pro-vaccine people, I, I really see that this is another form of 
hubris that actually goes completely against the wisdom of the body and herd immunity and all the ways we've survived millions of years on the planet. And so I, I think there's another example of us thinking that our technology and that our ideas or some of us are actually superior to nature and that and that these ideas are being used to force people into a way of living that takes away the freedom to the sanctity of their own body, their own choices, and how they're going to do everything from parent their children to protect their children. And it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting thing to see how far down a rabbit hole of one idea or one concept people can get without actually doing the research or even being open to looking at other possibilities. It's, it's no different than fundamentalist religious dogma. Well, you know, I, I, because of my, uh, my lack of knowledge and maybe my level of intelligence, I just, uh, again, I, I go to the simple, the simple form of, you know, of ego, right. Of man's ego and, 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 and thinking that, that he's that man, that us, that we're, that somehow we're, you know, that, that we're superior to, to, Viruses to start to 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 start and that when some but somehow that somehow we have uh you know that somehow we that that we you know and and again my my world that I live in I'm reminded on it you know on a consistent basis you know like when you go below the surface of the water there is no air there and uh, you know all of my strength and intelligence and understanding and schooling and reading and all that stuff can't make me breathe underwater i've yet to be able to do that and so it's pretty clear about that that define that separation of you know you can you can't that is that's not i mean there's certain governing you know there's certain uh, things that were, you know, universal laws and things that were governed by that all of us were governed by. And so far I haven't seen anybody, you know, jump out of a plane that can land without a parachute unless maybe they landed in the mud or got lucky and, you know, hit the water and didn't die. But, um, you know, so, so I, I find it, you know, I, I, but again, it's ego, you know, uh, you find that, 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 and I have to be careful, you know, I, I, and I, we talked about it earlier. What is our each our own personal greatest threat to ourselves? What is our own personal greatest threat to ourselves? Is our ego? Like is our that's our greatest threat? So it would make sense to me that it would also be the single greatest threat to mankind. Like that would why yes, would that yeah. be any different? If, it's, if, 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 if my ego is my greatest threat, then ego is the greatest threat to 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 mankind. That's I mean I just think that that. You know, and that speaks right to people, you know, thinking that they, you know, what they know is, is, you know, is all there is to know, or they know all there is to know, or, you know, or what they know is all they need to know or whatever that, you know, whatever, whatever games we want to play with ourselves to, to justify our behaviors. You know, I mean, I think we can, we can all somehow paint a nice, uh, appropriate picture to make us justify however we want to act or what, however we want to behave. Um, you know, we, we. And I don't know what comes first, you know, do we do the thing so that we can behave the way we want to, or, or, you know, it's like, or do we behave the way we want to? And then we get the, you know, it's, again, it's back to the, you know, what came first, but. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting too, because when Jung talks about the Imago Dei archetype, which is the first archetype from which all archetypes emerge in the human psyche and um, Imago Dei means image of deity. So whatever a person's image or inner picture or belief of what deity is or God is, whether that be science or uh, an atheist view, uh, the primordial soup, the Big Bang, or uh, an intelligent God or whatever. But Jung says it's impossible to tell whether the Imago Dei creates our beliefs about God or if our beliefs about God create our Imago exactly. Day. No, exactly. That's exactly my, you know, that's, that's exactly, exactly the point. Right. So it's, it's, it, it's, uh, I, I've been, uh, reading a little bit, um, an Adlerian, some Adlerian, uh, psychology, mm -hmm. behavioral uh, psychology, it's interesting. 
how 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 you see that playing out consistently um you know amongst the and and, and, and you know and in Kama Sutra they have like four you know four kinds of men four kinds of women i mean it's like there's some certain things that we're just not getting away from like we don't we're not that stuff and i don't care how you know what what outfits we wear and stuff we do there's just certain there are certain things that we're you know and gabby and i talk about there's certain aspects of biology that we have to understand better so we can understand why we're behaving the way we're behaving because right now we're kind of like like in denial of that stuff but that stuff's you know the system some imprinted i mean this stuff is branded into our souls like you're not just you know, mopping it all up real quick and being like, okay, yeah, we're, we're a completely different thing. We're still, you know, we're still doing, we're still behaving in, in ways and, 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 and acting things out that we were doing when we didn't have houses. I mean, you know, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. There's a, that's the nature of, that's the nature of an archetype. It, you know, it, it extends itself through the psyche indefinitely no one can escape being born by way of a mother and there's no one that can come without a father even if he just gave the sperm but you know with the 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 archetypes that allow us to make meaning of anything relate to things like being a victim being a saboteur being a prostitute being a child being an eternal child being a warrior being a king being a slave those are archetypes and in my belief system, from my research and working with this for many years, I believe archetypes are the root language of consciousness. So essentially, if the universe is a self-intelligent, sentient, living entity, if you will, it has to have some way to communicate. And I believe archetypes are the root language. Just like if, you're, if you speak English, you're basically making a myriad of, of ways of communicating out of 26 symbols called the alphabet. So you could say the alphabet is the archetype of the English language. And I think that the things that you're referring to really are primal and essential to the unfolding growth and development of whatever it is that's emerging through us, because without those experiences, it seems we're not going to get the awareness that ultimately is seeded in whatever's happening in life itself well i mean listen just you just see it playing around playing out i mean again it's observation right we just go back and look and watch if you're if you're aware and you know and being scared can be like you said heightened awareness just just look and observe and you know what uh, seems 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 it seems pretty consistent that we have the same behavioral patterns, you know, that, that you, that you speak of with these archetypes and, and it's, and the only way we can really, you know, transcend that is you, I mean, the effort it takes to do that, it, first of all, has to be, you know, the awareness that that, first of all, that, 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 that exists. I think that's something that, that, you know, any solution is, in my opinion, is, is, is you know a part of any solution is first the full understanding of what the problem is, or 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 what the issues are, or what you know what the what it is. And so, if we say, hey, the, the archetypes are the things that are setting this, then we can go and be like, okay, well, understand those, and then build from there. But you know, I, I, I believe that that what you're saying, the archetypes, and then we can have the behaviors of that. It's like, hey, I want to yell, so I'm, I'm going to get a situation to yell about. You know, but I want to yell first and then then the situation shows up and then I can yell because that's what I wanted to do. And so uh, I think it's, you know, it, it's it's an interesting, I mean, again, w you know, what we don't know, what we what we don't know. Yeah. You know, you know, Laird, when we're talking about all this, we're talking about the human hubris of knowledge and, and being overconfident in what you know without, you know, giving due diligence to, you know, it's kind of like uh, yin and yang. No matter how much you know about yang, if you don't know about yin, you don't know that much and you don't know where you're headed. Um, I'd like to hear your opinion on the whole biohacking thing. Personally, I, I find a lot of biohacking is really leading people into codependence on technologies. I think a lot of it's getting even bordering on dangerous planting chips and brains and all 
sorts of shit. And, and I look at a lot of this stuff and say, look, if you would just practice six foundation principles, nutrition, hydration, sleep, breathing, thinking, and movement, you would get rid of all the things that you need, all these devices, pills, gimmicks, electrical this, and buzz that. And you would find that, that far better than biohacking is bioharmony. I'm just curious, what's your take on with all the, all the kind of biohacking movement? Well, you know, I mean, I, I would, I, you know, I, I, could, I would say the first thing that comes into my, in, in my mind it, it, it about is it if you let's, let's just look at, let's just talk about uh, if you said plastic surgery, you said, okay, I got plastic, you know, we have plastic surgery and it's amazing if somebody is gets hurt and something bad happens to somebody or so, you know, whatever occurs, we can totally make them okay. And then we look at, you know, the abuse of that system and, and, and what, and what that does. Right. So you have biohacking, there's incredible things about biohacking. There's, I mean, it's amazing. You can do this and you can do that. And it's all this stuff. Right. Um, and then, and, and then there's the abuse of it, right? Then there's a, well, I don't have to do this. I can do that. And I don't have to do this. I can do that. And it's like, and then there's, and then there's shortcuts, right? And I, I, I just think that there's no shortcuts ultimately to, to health. I mean, and wellness and, 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 and a complete, you know, holistic approach to wellness. I don't think there's a shortcut. I don't think you could just bypass, Hey, you don't need to sleep because we have this new thing in it. You know, you only, you only have to sleep for an hour if you, you know, inject this stuff or have this pill or, you know, or use this light or whatever. I just think that, um, I think there's, you know, I think there's real benefits from some of the, I, I think it's an interesting field and it's, in, and, and, and used in situations where it can enhance, uh, things that you're doing. If you're, you know, if you're, uh, you know, abusing yourself because you're running way too much or, or you're doing, you know, whatever it is that you, that you want to help support there. I think there's pieces to it, but, uh, that can support the system, but that's only after that you're doing all of the other things that you've stated, which is, you know, taking, taking care of, you know, the spokes on the wheel, back to the wheel, the wheel's not going to roll. If, you, if you're, if one of your spokes, loose, you know, yeah. you can't, you can't, you can't you yeah. can't get away from that. The wheel has the spokes. The wheel's always going to have the spokes until you eliminate the spokes. Until maybe you you take your consciousness and 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 pop it in a chip and put it in a you know a robot. You know you you won't need to eat and you won't need to sleep and all that stuff. But the, but the truth is is that you know in my opinion I I think that that you know that there's no shortcut right. There's no and then there's the abuse of these systems like we we're discovering these things that can support and benefit the system especially when there's issues that would that you could you could use extra help especially because we get you know now now more than ever we're, our environments are more toxic our, our, our we're bombarded more by you know by the art the, the these devices that we're using i mean i just think that there's a lot of you know there's there's a lot of different kinds of pollution uh, you know, spiritual, environmental, you know, just all the stuff, just, just go, go down the list of, of it. And there's, I think there's aspects that can help, you know, help, help us with, with that, but, but not in replacement of, so you, as an added, added thing. And, and, you know, and again, um, back to the, the, the human condition, which is avoid discomfort. Let's go back to, well, see, let's just, uh, you know, let's, let's, let's be safe avoid discomfort uh you know and so i i think that, that that's my my feeling i think there's times to you know there's ways that you can use aspects of it and 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 then to what means you know to what means because I, I think there's 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 organic biohacking which i you know maybe i said he could be even considered you know a, a form of biohacking right but i would look at that as an organic source of uh, of, of biohacking you know versus that's what I call harmonizing though. Cause you're really working with the forces of nature. You're not trying to take shortcuts. One of the reasons I bring it up is cause I'm forever dealing with athletes that come to me with all sorts of fricking pills and gadgets and shit. And I tell them you are trying to take shortcuts to success. You have to authentically do the work. There's no such thing as a champion in a bottle and you know, you look at like Lance Armstrong and all the doping and I've, you know, worked with so many athletes that are, 
And then they say, oh, well, everyone else is doing it. I say, well, yeah, well, that's good. And, and they have to deal with the consequences of that. But you have to realize that no matter what, there's a game at play. By definition, a game is anything with a set of the rule, with a, with a set of rules and spectators. So life has rules and it has spectators. We're all watching each other. If you're a sprinter, then you agree to certain things and everybody else is a spectator. And if the rules are you don't use drugs, but you're, everyone else is using drugs, then you have to decide, well, what game are you playing? You know, so really it becomes kind of a, a, a confusion about, well, what is the game at some point? So it, it, everything starts kind of becoming fuzzy, you know? And so when I see young guys, for example, that need a heart rate monitor to tell them what their heart rate is, I say, look, if you actually pay attention to the level of exertion that you're under and look at your heart rate, geez, I'm running this hard, biking this hard, swimming this hard. And when I feel this level of intensity, uh, the last 20 times I checked my heart rate, it was 197. Well, good. Now throw your freaking heart rate monitor away and pay attention to what your body's telling. And you don't need a battery. You don't need an electrical circuit. You don't need a device. And you've learned something and it's called effective self-management. So for and I've had like a couple of 19-year-old athletes get a hold of me because they couldn't get off of Viagra. And I'm like, Jesus, Murphy, you're 19 years old. Your dick should be harder than a dinner bell at that age. And you're taking Viagra. And so ob obviously they're they're not tuned to the very foundation principles that make a young, healthy man, a young, healthy man. And all the pills and all the gadgets in the world are only tricks of deception that ultimately come at some kind of a cost. I think that's what concerns me about the whole thing. And that is linking back to this sort of idea of mental hubris. Oh, I, all you got to do is take this and that'll happen. But there's no awareness of the fact that every system in the body is connected to every other system in the body. And there's no way you can manipulate one system without effect on every other system, just like there's no way you can throw a pebble in a swimming pool of any size and not affect every single water molecule in the pool. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, right? And like you said, what's the game? Like, what are you doing? What's the game? If you're going into a situation where you're participating in a, in a, a sport where everyone else is you know, at a level of consumption, uh, you know, and you're not at the same level of consumption, then you might not be competing. So you got to make, you know, that's just a decision you'll have to make. Um, you know, I, 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 I've been fortunate in my world that I haven't been in, in a, in a, in a, in a sport that, that, you know, that you, that you, to, to play the game, you have to, you have to, you have to, uh, you know, kind of use a certain, a, a certain, uh, you know, a, a certain chemical for that matter, or however you want to describe it. But I, I just, my, our, my sport hasn't really, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not governed by that. And it's so, it's so, so, you know, and, and I would have to ask myself at, at a point that I was, if I was in a sport that I had trained my whole life to become great or the greatest at, and, and if I didn't, you know, take something to that everybody else was taking that they that I couldn't have a chance to win and they would um whether I wanted to do that I mean that's 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 a decision that every you know person has to make uh on their own and 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 decide but knowing that really there's a there's a repercussion uh for that for every you know for 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 all of that stuff there's going to be there's going to be a, a payment you know you're going to you're going to you, I mean, listen. Anything that, anything that allows you to do to go beyond our normal capacity, right? And, and we, I mean, listen. There's some guys that are great, and some guys that are greater, and some guys that are even greater. But when you get everybody together, there's there's kind of a there's a there's like an equilibrium. There's a there's a there's a you know we're all ninety eight point six more or less, right? So there's just a certain output that. And, you know, and, and some people have the mental fortitude and the ability to go beyond that stuff. But when things are so beyond out of that, you know, out of that, that realm, I mean, it, there's a reason. There's just, there's just, a, there's a reason. They're just this, like this stuff. I mean, you know, there are people that are, 
you know, genetically gifted and, 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 and have the right upbringing and all, all these things. But when things are so, you know, that isn't a skill that you develop because you had 10,000 more hours than the other guy, but that it's something more tangible, you know, the, the, there's, there, there's, a, there's, you just can't have that. And, and, and the fact is, is that, you know, part of it is the demand for that, like the demand, like, Hey, you go in and you, and there's a demand for performance. Like we're, we're, we're going to the Olympics. You got to break the world record. Well, if every single person before you that broke the record had, you know, 30 cups of coffee, you're probably not going to go there and do it on, a, you know, one cup of tea. It's just not going to, I mean, it's just, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just saying, like, it's like, it, it, it just, so again, you know, the, 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 the audience, the, you know, the, the, the world wants it, right. The world's demanding that from you. They want a warrior, you know, you, you, you we want our warriors to, to, you know, be able to, to perform at this level. We need our warriors to do this thing. That's the standard. And then, and then, and then, so you just have to decide if you are going to subject yourself to that, to that, to that world, you know, to that, to that format. And, and, uh, and, and that will come at a cost. I mean, I think they did a study. They said, you know, if they, they asked some Olympic uh, athletes, if they said, if, you know, if you could win a gold medal, how many years of your life, like, would you give up five or 10 years of your life? And I think some like 80 or 90% of all of the athletes all said that they would be willing to give up like a certain amount of of years of their life to, to win a gold medal. Of course, they're also all young, which when you're young, you think you live forever. But um, I bet the percentage would change if, you know, they were asking the people at, you know, 60 or 70 years old. But, um, but, but the truth is, is that, that, you know, there's a, there's a cost, there's just a cost for, for, for that. And, uh, you know, and, and, and that's, and, and that's, I mean, and that's just, unfortunately the way the way it is i mean i think the part the part that i that 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 i'm always confused by is how we want to pretend like nothing's going on so that's the part that i'm a little bit like okay well can we just be forthcoming and be like hey we're all doing it everybody's doing it so if this guy's the best he's the best he's just the best and he's doing it versus he's not as good and he's doing it like but, but, but we want to have, you know, it, it's an interesting dynamic and you probably have some, so, uh, you know, some psychology, why that is the way it is. But, you know, it's like, Hey, we want to pretend like everybody, you know, we're all, no one's doing anything, but then somehow, you know, we need them doing, we, we need them performing at a level that only can be done if we're doing something, but no one's doing anything. It's just, it's just, it, it just. I, 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 it's, it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a very strange dynamic that, that puts ultimately puts the athletes in a, in a very awkward position. And, and it's kind of, it's not completely fair in my opinion. I mean, I, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, you know, and, and I think part of it has to do with, okay, well, you know, kids, you know, we don't want our, because when we have our kids, you never think about your kids, like, Hey, I want my kid to grow up and, you know, and, 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 you know, have to use a certain level of performance enhancement to do a thing. You'd never want that on your kids, but somehow we demand that out of our men. And so it's, it's just an interesting, it's, I, and I, and I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer to what's right and what's wrong about it. Um, but I know it's a difficult, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. Like all of these, you know, like these, uh, you know, like these social, I think it's all connected somehow to this uh, a similar mechanism. Yeah, it is. It's it's very deep and it's very complex, but I think that's what makes life a legitimate adventure is that we really can never know for sure where the boundaries are. Um just, we can never yeah. really know for sure if if we're all playing the same game, right? Yeah. We all think if you and I are eating chocolate, we both assume that we're having the same experience, but the reality of it is we can be having radically yeah. different inner reactions and inner experiences. And so I think when it comes to meaning or to values or to rules, um, I mean, all you got to do is talk to a lawyer to find out how flexible rules can be even when to the rest of us, they look very rigid and very clear. So, 
I think it really just boils down to individual perception and individual needs and how desperate somebody is to feel loved, valued, wanted, needed. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a much more complex issue than I think you or I are going to dissect in a few minutes, but it's certainly uh, genuinely part of the human condition. Well, I, you know, I, I, I think that a lot of it, because it came to my mind that, you know, it, it is based on, on, you know, competition, that being competitive yes. uh, with one another. And, and I don't mean just in sport. I just, I'm talking about competition in general. And, 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 and when we, when we are competitive with one another, then we make the other our enemy. Right. And so, and then, and then we need to one up them. So then we need to know like, Hey, I got a secret thing that gives me an advantage over him. And I don't want him to have it. If he, if they were our comrades or if they were our, you know, if they were our comrades, then we would share our things. And I, I think that's one of the, you know, that's a philosophy that I, I try to live with, live by, you know, just the more of a sharing and less of trying to, I, I, I'm by nature highly competitive. I think it's a biological thing that's in you to procreate and all that crazy stuff. But the truth is, is that I, I think that that when you make anyone your competitor, then then ultimately they become your enemy, and I, and so and then you'll you'll do whatever it takes to to you know kind of one up them. And and I think when you, I know I really enjoy sharing and. You know, it, it, it's like you might have like and I'll just give an analogy of like uh, like I have a surfboard that I really like. And then somebody that, you know, is one of my, you know, contemporaries or comes up is like, hey, what's that board? What's the dimensions? What's the thing? And, and it's like, you know, if you feel confident in what you do, you'll be like, here, take my board. You can ride my board. You can get one made like my board. I'll tell you everything about my board, because no matter what, you're not me. And it and, and doesn't mean that you're you it's not competitive it's just that you're that i'm gonna write it the way i write it and you're gonna weigh that you're right it's back to what we said earlier when we were talking about everybody being different and that similar but yet yes. different that you have to be okay with your that just your uniqueness is enough that that give that's your it, whether it's your advantage advantage or no advantage but that's that should be enough for you not that you're that you have to beat the other person and, and win, but that you should be okay that just your uniqueness is enough. Yes. I, I've, the way I address that with athletes, particularly young athletes is, is I say, look, if you get rid of the concept of winners and losers and convert it to winners and learners, then if somebody beats you, then you've just met your teacher or someone who has the ability to teach you something either about yourself or about a new way of skill or viewpoint or mindset. But if you keep playing the winners and losers game, then ultimately what you have to do is objectify another human being. And that's the only way we can really turn them into an enemy because in our hearts, I think we're all deeply connected to the awareness of, of a higher truth of ourselves as expressions of unity and when we have losers, we then have to objectify people as objects to justify doing what we've got to do to get to the power position of being the winner or the glory position. But when we're in the loser position, we can fall into the trap of over, over deifying ourselves as a failure, over energizing that. And, and that I think leads a lot of people to doing extreme things like biohacking, steroids, drugs, shortcuts, because it now becomes, I'll do whatever I got to do to defeat the enemy, which is kind of like what happens in the political system. It's just like, okay, if you don't want to do it the way I want to do it, then I'm going to bomb your ass. You know, it's sort of like everyone just keeps upping the ante, but to do that, you have to actually turn other people's into objects. Well, that, yeah, well, that's, and that, and that, I mean, and again, it, back to another formula, right? There's a few formulas that are governing us. And this is, this is another one of those formulas that, that we're being subjected to and, and participating in. And, and, you know, and it probably fits right in with your archetypes, you know, it's just like, again, right back to, right back to the, like some, some foundational kind of imprints on 
on our behavioral patterns that that force us into this thing. And it, it must be somewhat, I mean, it must be amusing, I would think, for, for you know, the designer. <laughs> Ah, yes, it is. It is. I'm sure it is. It's just like, yeah. you know, yeah. I always, I describe when, when, when I'm talking to my students and they're asking questions about God, I, 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 I tell this little story. I say, imagine you were a, a genius child with infinite intelligence and creative ability. And the only way you could amuse yourself was to challenge yourself so you created games like a video game, except you made an agreement with yourself that the that in order to win the game, you have to jump into it and you cannot get back out of it and realize who you really are until you win the game. So I visualize God as this, this genius child that keeps coming up with all these games like, you know, the war game, the love game, the sex game, the money game, the philanthropy game the the martyr game you know the the uh you know all of it right and 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 god says i'm going to jump in there so fully that i'm going to get a complete experience of my own creations and i will wear this mask called an ego to create this illusion so that I don't really know who I am and what I'm capable of, so I can really honestly test my game. <laughs> I think that's what's going on. Well, I won't. I won't argue with you. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, when you spend enough time meditating on it, you start kind of getting hints, right? You start saying, "Okay, I'm starting to. I'm starting to get get what's going on here." It's, and and. You know, if anything, God has one hell of a sense of humor. You got to, I think, agree with that one. Yeah, well, and and I and I think it'll 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 make itself more known when we have better understanding because probably there's probably a lot of stuff that that w that we consider horrific that at the end when we understand we might not look at it quite that way. So you know, I I I, I wanted to share one thing that came into my mind uh, it, it, when you were. Uh, describing the the game of the video game of god but the you know somebody's uh, one of the best quotes i've heard recently when somebody asked about um somebody's faith and 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 the guy said you know i conduct myself they go do you believe in god and i said i just i conduct myself like he exists and i and i and i i had to really appreciate that i thought that that was probably one of the one of the better answers that I've ever heard in response to someone asking about somebody's faith. And, and, uh, and I related well to that, you know, like somebody goes, well, what do you, you know, what do you believe? And I, well, well, I, I conduct myself like, you know, that he exists. I thought that was great. Yeah. I think that's a great way to do it. I mean, it's, there's the old saying, um, whether God exists or not, if you believe in God, then that opens the door to the potential for an afterlife. And if you don't believe in God, then maybe your mind will convince you that there is no God. So if you're going to die, it's safer to believe in God because then you're open to the possibility. <laughs> so Amen. it's kind of like, yes, I yeah. <laughs> and you know, I think, I think most intelligent human beings that are mature enough to have enough of a view of life would, would agree that love is really the glue that holds the whole thing together. So if God is anything, since it's God's creation, then God must be love. So really, uh, you know, like Osho used to say, God is not a noun. God is a verb. And if God is love, then loving is a legitimate experience of God. And so, no matter what happens when you die, I find the more love you have and the more love you share, the more fully you've lived and the less scary death becomes because you don't have to leave feeling that you haven't been loved or given love because love is a boomerang. You, you know, when you give love, it comes back. It's just how the whole universe works. So if we operate on the premise that if God is love, then it's better to participate with that concept than it is to go the other way. Because if you go the other way, then 
what have you got? You've got isolation, you got fear, you got pain. Um, and you know, you, 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 the problem with evil is that, is it, it accumulates, but it segregates. So you end up having lots of stuff, but you're all alone. And the one thing evil doesn't accumulate much of is love. And if that's what holds the whole thing together, then it's the most fundamental concept. Then evil actually is a dead end road. Well, yeah, well, maybe that's what a black hole is. So, <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, this is really good. I really appreciate you taking the time to okay. share and be open and honest and share some love. And um, I'll, I might have a look at this and see if we can break it into two parts and just run them in two weeks su su successively okay. because I think it's – we're covering so many topics that might be easy to do. It'll give you more exposure for your marketing, your stuff. It'll probably work out pretty good that way. Um, just tell me right now on my, t I don't know where you're at. It's 325 here. Where yeah, are you? 325. Oh, are yeah, you I'm in LA? LA. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, tell me what time you want to stop by. You want to stop at like 10 sure. to four? Okay, good. I'll, I'll keep an eye on the yeah. clock just so I can pace us. <clears throat> All right, you ready to yep. dive back in? Okay, June, we're going back at it. Well, there, you know, I've been fortunate to, you know, have time with you, uh, have you spend the night at the house and share meals and exercise together and talk together and so I, I've got a pretty good sense of the depth of, of, you know, Laird Hamilton. It's, it's funny. I've had a lot of people ask me, what's it like to be with Laird Hamilton? And I say, well, do you know who Kyle Kingsbury is? And a lot of them do. I say, have you ever, have you ever met him? And some of them say, yes. I said, well, there's only two people I can think of that are that solid, that put together and that stable and that, full of power. Uh, do you know, you know, Kyle you know Kingsbury, Kyle don't you? Yeah. So I say being with Laird is like being with a, a true alpha male that has a clear sense of direction. And you get this very visceral sense that you don't want to get in the way <laughs> if you, if he wants to do something, you know, but uh, I'm curious, who are some of the key people that have had a really like formative influence on your development as a human being naturally of course your mother I, I i know i think i share that with you there but are there people that that you've uh really had profound or deep or meaningful experiences with you that left an imprint that ultimately have influenced who you've become and how you navigate well life? you know i mean you like you you know my, of course my mom was the beginning of that. And I mean, I would say Gabby is, is also, you know, I, I think that, I mean, I've been with Gabby now for, you know, 22, 23 years going on 24 years, something like that. And, uh, her influence as well on me. I mean, you know, I can't even put into words just the, the, just all of the, all of the effects of, of being in that a, a relationship, being, you know, a husband, being a father um, and, and how that's played out and just how, how, you know, her, her, her voice of reason, you know, throughout, uh, throughout the years together, uh, you know, I, I, I've had mentors that I've looked up to, you know, men that, that, and there's, and, you know, different ones for different reasons, uh, you know, in, in my life. I mean, Mr. Uh, Don Wildman, uh, who who's now about, I think it's been about almost going on three years since he passed away. Um, or we're in the second year. He, you know, he was a, a, an, an amazing man and, and someone that I, that I, you know, admired and spent a lot of time with and, um, you know, I, I, I've had different, you know, I've had men that I looked up to, uh, that in, in growing up and, you know, I, those, they, 
you know, they, they all kind of had certain similar, uh, you know, there was, there was things in common, uh, with them, you know, things that I admire in a man, um, you know, the, and, and then there's things that I don't admire in men, but, you know, when I, when I meet men that have those things that I admire, um, I'm attracted to, to, to them. And, you know, whether it's, whether it's humility or generosity, um, you know, of course, being empathetic. Uh, I mean, I just think that there's there's certain character traits that I admire um, that I have my whole life, and 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 you know, I I uh, they're family men men. They're you know, there's an honesty to them. There's just certain things that that I'm that I'm drawn to. You know, Don Don was uh, was a unique man, and you know, he's a for those people that don't know Don Wild Man, that's his actual given name, and he was a uh, he founded Bally's uh, Health Clubs, and he was in the Korean War, and he did the first Iron Man when he was fifty, and then he did like ten consecutive Iron Men after that, and and uh, you know trained like an animal till the day well to within weeks of his passing away, and and. Uh, went out, went out, you know, in style, like he would have liked to have gone out quick with minimal, uh, you know, minimal, uh, debilitation and just, just, just a, but, but a, a, a super generous, amazingly generous guy, um, that, that, you know, that, that I admired, I just admired his, the way he was as a, as an individual. And, you know, I, I think that, and I've had other, other, other men, um, like that, and I could say, you, you know, I could say, Paul, that you're you're one of the men that that I've I you know that I I look to, I've looked at and admired. Uh, you know, I what I I think I've been cautious because of my upbringing, and you know, I had people that that I looked up to that kind of, you know, you know that old saying, no no expectations, no disappointments, but you know some. Right. Put that pressure on someone. I think it's not always fair to them. So I, I try to avoid make putting uh, people on pedestals. I think that that's a because we're all just human and we all fall short of the glory. You know, it's it's, and I think that that's something that 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 you have to be cautious of. You have to be cautious to not to not do that to 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 someone. And maybe you can admire their certain traits that they have and a certain way they are, but I think it's, I think it's not fair to, to put too many expectations on, on someone that you look up to. And I, I know that, I know, um, it's affected me in, 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 in my life I, that, that I, I understand that I can, you know, that I can be looked up to by, by kids or, and, and so that, that does influence, you know, the way I, the way I behave and the way I live, because I want to be that I want. And maybe because I saw that when I was growing up, you know, like you have your, somebody you look up to and then you meet them and you, you know, you're disappointed and you know, some of that you can never avoid. And, and maybe you, you can't worry about that. And, but at the same time, I think there are certain things that are actually in your own best interest. They're actually in, you know, going to, going to create a better life for you. And, you know, there's the, I mean, it's like why why we have these teachings to save us from a long grief, and so you know, it, it, it's it's you know, Gabby and I talk, uh, and this is off top off off the question, but we talk about our children, and you know, one one daughter, you know, we we have, we 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 tell her, you know, if you behave this way, you, you know, then then it'll be good for other people, and then she's like, oh, okay, that's really good, and then the other daughter, we tell her, hey, if you behave this way you know, it'll be good for you. And she goes, Oh, okay. You know, and, and it's the same thing, but each one of them, you know, benefit from a, of a, a different technique, uh, even though you're telling ultimately the same, the same thing. So, but yeah. have, uh, I'm just, if I could interject, have you ever listened to the second book of the Tao or read the second book of the Tao by not. Stephen Mitchell? Oh, I think you'd really enjoy it. Um, but anyhow, he, he talks about this in there and he tells, uh, you know, how Zen masters and Taoists use teaching stories, parables and allegories and things like that. But he says, uh, 
a new monkey trainer was hired at the zoo. He went to meet his new monkeys. He brought seven oranges with him. He met the monkeys and he says, now listen, monkeys, every morning I'm going to give you three oranges and every afternoon I'm going to give you four. And all the monkeys got upset. They threw a fit, started screaming and throwing things and they were very unhappy. And he says, okay, I'll tell you what. Every morning I will give you four oranges and every evening I will give you three. And they were all happy. No. Yeah. And the moral of the story is oranges. Um I was listening to an interview you did with Lewis Howes. Is his last name pronounced yeah. Howes? And uh, you were speaking to him about having just put him through a breathing workout. And in the beginning of the interview, you spoke, spoke about the connection between the soul and the spirit and the breath. And it triggered me to ask you a couple of questions because those words are, are commonly used, but they have as many meanings to different people as the word God does. And just like the word God, there's very little understanding amongst them. I'm just curious, within your own philosophy or your own spirituality, what does soul and and spirit mean to you? What are those? What do they encapsulate? Well, uh, when I think about spirit, when I think about the, the spirit, I think about uh, the the life, you know, the life, the life force. The the I think about that 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 the spirit is the energy of who I am that's in my vessel, the body. And I, I and, and, you know, and, this, and for me, I feel that the soul is, the soul is the behavior of the spirit, you know, like the, like the, 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 maybe the color, you know, maybe the color, the colors and the, the colors of it and the movement. And for me, that's my, but when I think of the spirit, I think of that the that the spirit is the is the force that possesses my body. When I breathe in, I breathe the spirit in, and and I was I was you know I I was the I was the the you know the the me that I am, and then and then when I pass away or when I when my breath leaves my body. Uh, then my spirit will move, and, and 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 my soul for me represents the the you know the 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 character of it, the the actual you know the 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 color, the color of it, like the personality of it. Mm-hmm. In alchemy, uh, I'll, I'll share something with you because I think you might find it interesting. I've studied alchemy extensively and studied Jung's work for probably 25 years. And I've developed my own system of alchemy. And, and as you know, I study these things quite deeply, both through studying them through books and various times with experts and also my own spiritual practice. So whenever I have a question, I do two things. I say, what, what, what human beings out there that are, you know, of high caliber, could I rely on their information? And then I either study their teachings or videos or their books. And then I say to my own soul, now I need you to share with me as the consciousness within. I refer to soul, soul as the consciousness within. Um, I ask my soul to guide me and say, okay, what, what does God or consciousness have to say about this? And when I did that with my soul on the issues of soul and spirit, uh, I, I basically got told that what the alchemist taught was really the closest to the truth. And the male aspect of us is taught by the alchemist as spirit. And that's the flow of energy and information, which we cannot separate ourselves from the entire cosmos. You know, there's everything we eat depends on the sun, the earth, the moon, the stars, the galaxy, the universe, right? There's no way you can break the distinction. So, Spirit to the alchemist was the flow of energy and information and soul was the receptive feminine principle. And they give a really beautiful analogy. I think you might like, they talk about back in the old days when Kings and Queens and, and people like that used to seal 
envelopes with with hot wax and they would put their stamp in it. Are you familiar yeah. with that concept? So they would describe the wax as the soul and the stamp as the spirit. And each person has their own information, their own signature, their own uniqueness. Their Laird has his Lairdness. Paul has his Paulness. And so the imprint, the energy and the information that is imprinted, they described as spirit and the receptivity and the ability to mold to it. They often describe how water will take the shape of any vessel. They say that's the soul. It is the feminine receptive principle that allows you to experience what spirit is moving through you. And so it's, it's, uh, I think that's fairly close to what you, you know were what? saying, it's, isn't it? Which is, which is exactly the opposite, which is exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> it, it, exact well, flip, which you know is, what? is exactly the same, which I really, I do appreciate. In you know, it, it seems that that happens a lot, right? That the that the op the exact opposite is more the same than the in between of either, right? It's 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 like, yeah. But uh, yes, yes. To your point, your question, yes. Yeah, it's kind of that reminded me of the exact opposite, but the same Alan Watts in one of his lectures was talking about uh, the, the the yin and the yang concept. And so he he says somebody was, I guess he said something and someone said, well, isn't that positive, not negative, or shouldn't that be yang versus yin? And so he said, okay, here's a way to look at this. He says, if I have a white piece of paper and I put a black dot on it. Is the black dot positive or negative? And so everybody, you know, got to state what their opinion is. He says, okay, now if I have a blackboard and I put a white dot on it, is the white dot positive or negative? Well, the truth of it is if you look at it, a whiteboard with a black dot, the bot, black dot, even though it represents negative black, it sucks things into itself, it still appears to be projected off of a whiteboard. But if you put a black dot on a blackboard, you won't see it. If you put a white dot on a blackboard, it still appears to be projecting itself off the board. So what he showed is it doesn't really matter whether you assign positive or negative. What's really important is that there is a polarity differential, which is what allows currency, which is what allows spirit well, to and, move. And, and like you said, without, without spirit, there's no soul. Without soul, there's no spirit. So. Yeah, soul, soul without spirit would, would just be uh, exactly. an empty concept. Exactly. Like a penis yeah. without a, a vagina. Down. Calm down. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, this is a question that I, I ask my students because it's, it's one that perplexed me. And in my various meditations, I've worked with kind of the Tibetan concept of the death breath and I've been on plant medicines and really worked to use my meditation techniques and and breath control to do my very best to completely calm myself to the point where I could stop my heart. And I've actually had very profound experiences where I literally expanded out of my body just all the way to oblivion, you know, and again, didn't know how I was going to get back, but always managed to get back probably because you and I had to have this chat together, but, um, and a couple of kids wanted me as their dad, always, three of them actually. But, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of the discussion about breathing is really based at the body level. But I say to my students, why is it that you cannot stop yourself from breathing willingly? But some people can, for example, Yogananda could could turn his heart off and go into a death experience. I've studied the works of many uh, Zen masters who could actually completely stop their heart, have people check their vitals, and even stay dead for more than a day and then just turn themselves back on. And so having studied these different masters and then looking into you know what is it's going on from their perspective, but I went into really deep meditation and I tried to answer the question, what is it that is so interested in being me that it 
really doesn't like the concept of me stopping my breathing to the point that it threatens my existence. So having done all this breath work, I'm curious, have you ever reached that question in yourself? And if you did, what did you find out? Uh, well, I, I can only, I, I mean, I, one of the, one of the kind of, I, I had, I had, I had, uh, I've had some different kind of visions. I've had some different things happen where, you know, obviously where I saw, I saw the thing that's in me or whatever you want to describe it. I also like left, uh, left my body and observed it from above. Um, I told somebody a story mm-hmm. about that the other day. They looked at me kind of funny, but um, but you know, I, I had a I had a experience like that, and you know, I didn't have a question or 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 an answer as much as it, it really just solidified my under and and I, and I and I wish it would you know affect my behavior more. It seems to not really do it enough considering that I know it, but that, that, I, that I, you know, that, that there is a real, uh, that, that, you know, when I speak of spirit and soul and, you know, and breath that, that this, this is real. This is not, this is real. This is not like, you know, it sounds good or, you know, we're not hypothesizing. I mean, this is, this is, it's a, it's a little bit like if my question was, is it, is it real? The answer was yes. You know, is it, 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 is, it, did I, have I, did I can, you know, kind of confirm my suspicions? Did I, you know, did it, did it, did it, did it bring me to ease, you know, it, 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 for, in the quest of what, you know, what, you know, am I possessed by a spirit? Like, do, it, it, do, am I, do I have a soul? Do I have a soul? Do I have a soul? You know, is, is my soul and my spirit? in me in this temple it, it is it, it, it is it, it, it's definitely there and 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 you know and i did have uh and 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 i and i think that the, the breath for me the mechanism of the breath it makes it, it, it's understandable that that somebody who dedicated their their life to the the relationship between the vessel and the soul and the spirit and the breath, because the ha, you know, the breath is, you know, in a lot of cultures, the breath of life, they always talk about the breath of life and that, 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 that mm-hmm. the, you know, that the, the air, you know, that, that it would, it's interesting that the breath is air, right. That we're breathing air and that the air is, you know, there's all the space. that's not, you know, all not hard, not, 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 not water or rock or, and it's, it's, you know, and, and, and that, the, and that this, and that the spirit and the soul would be connected to the, to that, to that space, to that particular void um, means that that's probably where, you know, it's moving in and out of, that's where it is, you know? And so, mm-hmm. but yeah, I, I, you know, I, I have had those, you know, uh, and whether those were, whether those were visions caused by chemicals in my brain, because my, you know, because I, you know, my CO2 levels or my oxygen levels were blah, 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 and whatever else. I mean, sure, you, you can contribute that. I, I, you know, I always, it's interesting that you, when you really dig down in, you know, and you have intuitions and things and you sense things to be certain ways that when you pull the physical again i always talk i go back to the physical because that's the plane we're on that you you actually have there's there's always some kind of you know science that can back it up to show you yeah you're having this and that's why that and all those things and so and not to and sometimes i think people use that as an excuse to invalidate like to invalidate well you're just having that and that's why you had the vision well okay but yeah that's great but why do you manifest that vision and why do you have that experience and you know i mean I understand, you know, the mechanism that, that promoted that, but then what, you know, so, but yes, yeah. I answer your, I hope that answered your question, but yeah, I, I had not answered the question with seeking that, but just experiencing, you know, the relationship between, you know, the spirit, the soul, the vessel, the body, and then, and then the breath. 
Yeah, you know, I'll share a couple things. I've had that concept put to me by many of my students that are very left brain scientific materialists. I'm sure you know exactly the type I'm talking about. Consciousness can only exist in the brain. Any such altered states are the result of changes in the chemistry of your body, dot, dot, dot. But I have a very simple challenge for people like that. I say, look, I'm a remote viewer. I have demonstrated my ability as a remote viewer multiple times beyond a shadow of a doubt that can be verified. In fact, I won a remote viewing contest in London, England with 750 people in it. And if the ability to leave my body is based on chemicals in my brain, then how can you explain the fact that I can travel to any planet in our solar system or literally anywhere I can put my mind to and objectively identify what is there? I can go, you know, look in somebody's house on the other side of the world or go tell you what's on the moon and thousands and thousands of remote viewers have done it and it and it's so profound that the CIA for you know probably 30 years had their own remote viewing program and they used it to find russian submarines and everything else so when you actually look at what a human being can do with regard to separation from the body and remaining not just conscious but prove it objectively then that whole chemical argument is just completely thrown out the window because if that chemical argument was true then as you became more and more disabled, i.e. a near-death experience, you would be less and less conscious. But people consistently report being far more conscious in a near-death experience than they are when they come back into their bodies. Well, these, 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 these uh, vehicles are, are a little antiquated, Paul. You know, I mean, come on. We still, we still got to walk around and stuff. We can't even, you know, we can't fly yet. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, when I sought that investigation, because that's just the nature of my mind, I like to keep pushing the horizon. So I meditated on it and went deep into it. And uh, I experimented with it um, through Tai Chi, through breathing. And then I also did a series of plant medicine ceremonies where I used the support of the plant medicines. But really, ultimately, what I kept being shown well, there's two fundamental qualities to the nature of existence as we know it. In science, it's called the vacuum and the plenum. And when we look at zero point field science, what they show is that in emptiness, the emptiness of space is a constant bubbling up, welling up, frothing up of subatomic particles that become atomic structures that become uh, stars, planets, moons, galaxies, and, and the life that we know. But what I was shown is that the emptiness, which is really one of the qualities of God, that which is unconditional, can have only two qualities. It's absolutely empty of anything, which means it's simultaneously full of everything. And we know that the everything's here because here we are. So what I saw is that the emptiness of space is like a vacuum energy that draws so fully into itself that it turns around just like the Tai Chi symbols and pushes it out, which would be the exhal exhalation. So if you look at black hole science, black holes suck everything in for millions of miles, compress it down to you know incredibly high density, but then they explode and shoot what, what I would call the exhalation out. And you can actually see pictures from NASA of this exact process. And so I said, well, look, if the stars are inhaling and exhaling perpetually, and we are products of the stars. Naturally, our process of respiration is the foundation process behind which creation itself is moving, without which there would be no movement or time because everything's going from basically a state of emptiness to fullness or birth to death, something to no thing. So the emptiness in us is like the emptiness of space and it makes room for something. We inhale we are full, we exhale, we become empty again. So really what I found is that our breathing cycle is actually an emulation of the very process of creation at the most fundamental levels of reality. Well, that, that makes complete sense. And it goes back to what I said, which is exact op exactly the same, but opposite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> well, funny. But it's true though, but that, that, that's, that makes that makes a lot of sense to me. 
Well, just explore it in yeah. meditation. Um, if, if you're up to it, I mean, sitting in a, a sauna and, and just track, track the inhalation back and, and allow yourself to sit with the empty space yeah. in your lungs. And then what I do is I sit with the emptiness and I see how there's desire building. The more time the lung spends empty, the more desire builds. And just like a woman has this insatiable desire to get pregnant that can literally drive her nuts by about the time she's 36 and she hasn't has a child, it's the emptiness of the womb. It's calling life into itself. And once that womb is full, then she feels satiated. But what does she have to do? She can't keep it in there forever. She has to basically exhale that life, which triggers its own process of inhalation and exhalation. And thus, the process just goes on forever um, because from what I can tell, there's no beginning, beginning or no end to creation. I, I, I agree with Itzhak Bentov who said, it's incorrect to think of the Big Bang as the beginning. It should be considered another Big Bang. He said, there's no indication that there was a Big Bang because all the indications we see with uh, astrophysics and black hole science is that the universe is perpetually in-breathing, creating exhaling, destroying, and there's black holes all over the place. And Nassim Harriman even now suggests that there's a black hole in the center of literally every atom in everything, including our bodies. And we're in a constant flux. So I, I, I just, as I meditated on this, because it was kind of pestering me, I just like, I couldn't just stop at the, the kind of textbook physiology of it. it what, the deeper I got into it, the more I could actually see everything was breathing from the perspective of emptiness becoming fullness and fullness becoming emptiness because those are really the fundamental principles behind the entire process of nature. Well, that 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 makes uh, that it makes sense to me. You know that that makes sense. And and the th and the and the truth is is that you know I, I I love you know we are like I am it is we are it's like that it's there's no beginning no end and. And then, and then the you know the old saying you know how you do the little things is how you do the big things. Well, how little things exist or yes. how the big things exist. So it, 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 it's it's uh, it sounds like your your work is serving you well, Paul. And, you know, I, I I think it's important for me as a human being. You know, when I asked you what was your biggest challenge that you have to work on? I thought it might be similar to mine, but mine is that I have such a incredible sense of purpose and responsibility to humanity that I've had ever since I was a child that I often feel almost like I'm going to explode if I don't move my creativity and my curiosity and the knowledge I've gained from my pursuits of knowledge out into the public sphere to help people. And the challenge that that creates for me is that I, I can get so driven and so focused that even the people that I love can, can be irritating to me because I'm like, you know, it's kind of like when you're in the middle of good sex and the phone rings, it really kind of disrupts the process and the connection and sometimes I, I have such a deep connection to what I would call spirit, and there's so much trying to move through me, I, I feel like this massive pressure. And so if I'm not careful, I can find myself not spending enough time with my kids, not, you know, acknowledging my my Angie's and Penny's need for love and connection. Because I can go into, you know. Uh, kind of a wormhole existence very, very easily. I, I think the archetype of the hermit really suits me. And so that's really my firewalk is trying to find the balance between exploring and cultivating and practicing so I can be authentic, but also remembering I have to make room for everybody else in my life. <laughs> well, yeah, you can, you can give me that one too. I'll use your, I can use your answer as well. So that, 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 <laughs> I had a, I had a feeling, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you, yeah. I mean, when you're driven, it's, it's, it can be at the cost of everything. So that's probably the biggest challenge, but, but that's what I connect to ego to sometimes because part of that might be an aspect of ego that I, and, and so it's, it's important to, 
that's why I said the challenge for me is that if I just did that and I stripped everything away, then I would say I let my ego get the best of me. But if I continue to create balance and participate w- with with my family, with in my relationships, you know, and all all that, you know, all those other kind of, you know, the other pieces, the other spokes in the wheel, then the wheel doesn't go flat, you know. And the- yeah, exactly. Well, you know what? Speaking of that, I don't want to keep you too long. We've been going for probably getting close to three hours, yeah. and I'm really grateful for the time you've shared with me yeah. and and for all the love you share with the world, Laird. I've watched. Uh, a number of your presentations on on various television shows, interviews, your books. You know, um, I I really feel honestly, I feel um, I feel fortunate to be able to say Laird Hamilton's my friend, and I I feel that um, I just have deep respect for the love and the commitment that you and Gabby both share with the world, you know, and, and my podcast with her was absolutely excellent. And she's, she's really amazingly probably about the only woman I've ever met in the world that I think really has enough power to be your partner and be your equal. So the universe certainly, you know, matched you guys up incredibly well. So I just want to say thank you from my heart for everything that you do for the world and, and for your family. And, and you're such a, a great leader and a great example and, and a grounded human being. So, um, you know, my heart's always with you, buddy. Hey, Paul, I, I feel the same way about you. And, uh, you know, I've always, since I think the first, we first met, I, I've, we've had, you know, kindred spirits and, and I've always, my, I, I just, it, I admire your work and, and, uh, and I thank you for just all the help that you've given me and all the help, you know, all the people that you, that you help and continue to help. And, and, uh, well, I, I have a lot of admiration as well. So it, it's, it, it goes both ways. Thanks buddy. Well, lots of love, big hug. Yeah. And, uh, uh, next, I want to come see you when, and, uh, I just, I'll come at some point we'll come down there and do a little guest appearance, you know, come have a little, Oh man, I'd love to have you come, come give me a, a little warning and let's have a, a you know, a, enough time to go lift some rocks together and, and, uh, you know, just share the place with you and, and maybe do some painting together. I'd love to paint something. Hey, with you. I'll bring my daughter down. She, she's a, a beautiful artist. Let's have a painting party paint party. That'd be good. And just get all, get all paint, all paint out. <laughs> Yeah, we'll we'll paint our love and paint our reality yeah. and and that's that's adding life to life. I love it when the art spirit enters me. I know spirit and soul are real because my brush moves itself and I'm often truly amazed because I can't paint like that. <laughs> well, I I appreciate you and like I said, we'll we'll uh let's try to let's try to connect here and other than just this, but this was a good opportunity to catch up and and uh, again, I appreciate your, you know, pursuit of knowledge and and uh, and your and your uh, love of spirit and love to the family. And just please send send my uh, send my whole family's love to you, to you and your family. Okay, I will. And before you go, where can I direct people to to find Laird's Superfoods and anything else you want to direct them to? Um, no, I, I we uh, LairdSuperfood.com. So it, you can go to go to our site. LairdSuperfood.com, and then you can go to xptlife.com. That's all the the fitness stuff. We got some some uh, nice stuff on there as well. Those are the two most important ones, and then you know, of course, Life Rider, and uh, but that's 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 the two the two main ones. Cool. So it's l a i r d superfood.com. Yep. Great. Got it. Awesome. Go give everybody a hug and tell them I said hello. And let's try to visit each other as soon as we can. I look forward to it, Paul. God bless you. You too, bud. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Laird Hamilton. You can find Laird online at LairdHamilton.com or follow him on Facebook and Twitter at Laird Life and at Laird Hamilton Surf on Instagram. Check out his delicious superfood creamers, mushroom blends, coffee, and more at lairdsuperfood.com. 
Follow Paul on Instagram and Twitter at Living4D Podcast or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash Living4D with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and the Czech Institute's new streaming media site, chakiva.com. <laughs>